to call the special uh, meeting of the Palm Springs Planning Commission for July 21st, 2021 to order. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Elian. Here. Commissioner Irvin. Present. Commissioner Hirschbein. He's here. He just stepped away. Commissioner Roberts. Present. Commissioner Song. Present. Lucy. Here. Chair Womack. Present. Seven members present. We have a quorum. Can I'm I, back. Can I have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners, our agenda was published on Thursday, July 15th, and our meeting has been posted in accordance with state law. Uh, the next item is public comment. And uh, pursuant to the Brown Act, public comment is limited uh, to items that appear on the, no on the um, agenda for this meeting. Uh, each speaker will have three minutes. Are there speakers present, Mr. Newell? Yes, we've had uh, three people specifically contact us to speak tonight, and it looks like we have some other people who have raised their hands in the chat feature. So uh, I'll call on people as I see either your hand raised or as uh, you've identified yourself in the chat. So I'll start with Jane Garrison. Good evening. Do you can hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I am speaking this evening on item 3A number two, the uh, staff request for direction regarding two parcels for the general plan uh, update. Um, Oswit Land Trust strongly opposes any changes to two parcels, the Whitewater parcel, which is one of them that was asked about, and the Bel Air Greens uh, parcel. The Whitewater parcel is designated as open desert for a reason. That beautiful piece of land is sandwiched directly between two Coachella Valley multi-species habitat conservation plan conservation areas. It's the Whitewater conservation area just to the north and the Highway 111 conservation area to the south. And Whitewater Canyon has been designated by US Fish and Wildlife Service as a critical habitat for threatened and endangered species. These species don't know boundaries that we set. And so it's important to have surrounding these conservation areas designated land as open desert. And that's exactly what that parcel is. And I ask for you to please keep it designated as it is. The other one is the Bel Air Greens parcel, which we are all familiar with because it has become be before the Planning Commission many, many times. Um, Oswit Land Trust is very aware of the residents that surround that parcel and how the community has made it abundantly clear that they do not wish to see that parcel turned into housing or a hotel. So Oswit Land Trust has been incredibly proactive on that particular piece of property. We have been pursuing funding opportunities. We have been in touch with the owners, both the lease holder and the Alati owners. We have uh, been working on a grant with the state of California that we have made it to the final stage. And we are about three weeks away from finding out if we will be the recipient of a $4 million grant that we will use on that property. Our plan for that property is tremendous. It will benefit the community so much. It will be a beautiful restored nature preserve that we will be proud to have in the middle of Palm Springs. It will be a place that our neighbors and friends can go to enjoy the views, to bird watch and to walk. Changing the general plan designation of that particular parcel when we are right in the middle of this incredibly delicate process of grants and funding would be absolutely detrimental to us. So I ask you to please keep those two parcels as they are designated and, ha and as they were designated when the owners purchased them. So they knew what they were buying. We ask you to keep them as such. Thank you so much. 
Our next speaker is Bettina Rose Marino. Hi, good evening. My name is Bettina Rose Marino, and I'm on the board of Oswald Land Trust and also the founder of Palm Springs Wildlife Advocates. I'm calling about 3A number two requests to change land use designation for two properties. The first is located near the Whitewater Preserve area and is an important ecosystem in our desert. Blow sand is not something that is talked about much, but it's incredibly important to species in this habitat and in that area. There is already a drastic reduction of blow sand because of the railroad and the 10 freeway. Massive developments will further cause a reduction of desert blow sand. The current land use designation for this area is protected desert. I'm very concerned that if this designation is changed, massive overdevelopment will occur, such as the fulfillment center that was going before the commission back in February. There was a large community outcry about that concrete behemoth because our desert community values our desert so intensely and out of city and state developers rarely understand our passion. So please do not allow this land use change at the request of the owner of the property. Perhaps the owner would better consider selling this property to a conservation group. I know that Oswald Land Trust would be very interested. The second property that is of concern is the request from the tenant of Bel Air Greens to change the land use designation. This would be disastrous. Bel Air Greens is a cornerstone property right now for wildlife in our city. There are so many inhabitants who utilize it, including many birds of prey, coyotes, songbirds, rabbits, the Coachella Valley round-tailed ground squirrel, a state species of special concern, and there could even be Casey's June beetle in the ad adjacent wash which is a critically endangered species. Oswald Land Trust is a very interested buyer for this property and already has funding available, which Jane mentioned. If the land use designation is changed for the tenant, he has plans to do a massive development project. The community has rallied around important parcels before and would do so again to halt any development there. Please retain the, both of these land use designations as they are. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Sophia Summers. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, again, I would like to echo Jane Garrison's and Bettina Rosemarino's sentiments when it comes to 3A number two with the Whitewater parcel and the Bel Air Greens property. Um, you know, they said a lot about the particular pieces that I don't really need to reiterate. However, one thing that just really comes from my heart is the ability for me to learn about these places. Um, I'm fairly new to the desert and I learn more about this ecosystem and natural habitat every day that I'm here. And I know that there are plenty of people out there like me and there are younger um, people in this community that would love to have the same experience to, to just be able to learn about these places. And with the proposed plans for Bel Air Greens turning it in, into this nature conservancy, having the grant process already in the works, um, this is a really exciting thing. And I would love to see it uh, through to its fruition. And I mean, just the amount of lives that that could touch, not only, you know, animal lives, but, our, our youth would be incredible. And so I highly encourage you guys to consider um, what saving these parcels as like critical habitat uh, would do for the younger community here as, as we build our homes and our families in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Dee Crawford. Good, good afternoon, uh, staff and planning commission. Uh, my name is Dieter Crawford from the Desert Highland Gateway Estates Community Action Association. I just want to speak on the general plan and the housing element. So uh, first up with the housing element, um, I would like to see some self-help housing and home buyer assistance programs added uh, where residents can purchase homes and build equity 
similar to what Coachella Valley Housing Coalition has built in the past. Um, as an established neighborhood, uh, Desert Highlands still has no, nearly 100 vacant parcels available for infill land development. And we would like to um, see some uh, homes built out here as we've seen in the past, like I said, with Coachella Valley Housing Coalition in 2008 and also in the 1990s, uh, we did some mutual self-help help housing programs as well as um, on Chuckawalla and Cottonwood, the Coachella Valley Housing Coalition also built uh, nine single family affordable low income uh, houses. So I, I would like to see us do some more of those programs on the available land that we have. Uh, I know we have lots of land available um, from the Westman settlement deal. We have the Crescendo project, which is 41 acres and it's already zoned for multifamily housing. We also have the Boulders property, which is 31 acres um, and it's zoned R1. I've uh, included more about this on an email that I've sent. So um, you guys could check that out for more details. And also um, in Desert Highland neighborhood, with the land use, uh, we'd like to see uh, the R1 lots rezoned back to RGA6 along Rosa Parks, Granada, Tramview, and El Dorado as they were uh, years ago. Um, somewhere in the mid 1990s, the zoning was changed to R1 and uh, our community believes that that's an opportunity to bring in more multifamily housing units and um, as well as on Indian Canyon between Corazon and Tranview around the El Mundo Church, we would like to see this area zoned mixed use. Uh, we know Desert Highland lacks grocery stores, health clinics, and other community amenities such as banks. So we think that zoning that area mixed use would make it uh, more flexible and promote land development. Uh, my name is Dieter Crawford. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Our next speaker is Joan Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, Joan Taylor here representing Sierra Club. I'll be speaking to some uh, 3A2 and general plan issues. Uh, first, the Sierra Club requests the city change the land use designation and zoning of certain mountainous sites currently designated, quote, special policy, quote, areas. Namely, the former Shouter Rock site has been acquired for preservation and should be designated as conservation with no dwelling units. And more importantly, the special policy portion of Palm Hills should be designated open space mountain, one dwelling unit per 40 acres. That would be consistent with other city mountainous area policies and the voters express wishes for preservation of the site as dem demonstrated by a resounding referendum of the erstwhile Palm Hills project. Regarding the I-10 site near Whitewater, it appears partially within the conservation area under the Coachella Valley MSHCP, and uh, we believe it is inappropriate and unwarranted to create an island of potential intense development in an area that would otherwise be open space desert. Of vastly changing the general plan land use designation in this manner for a single site in the abstract may be a violation of CEQA, if not general plan case law. Uh, just speaking uh, for myself as a lifelong resident, I'd like to add that such intense development uh, would be unfortunate in this entry to the city, especially when there are better sites in already industrialized areas to the east and west along Interstate 10 for such intense uses. Finally, speaking again for Sierra Club, we support retaining the majority of the abandoned Bel Air Golf, Bel -Air Golf Course <clears throat> excuse me, in natural open space. Uh, we think it's part of the connective tissue of washes that preserve habitat corridors and multiple use trail amenities. And it is a very attractive open space relief for res residents and tourists enjoying the unique amenities the city can offer. Thank you for considering these important issues. Okay, thank you. And the next speaker we have is Maribel Nunez. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you, David. And thank you, uh, Planning Commission, Maribel Nunez, 
with Inland Equity Partnership. Uh, we have a Palm Springs um, group here on the housing element, and we have some recommendations. Uh, we definitely support everything uh, with the Desert Highland, what Dieter suggested. Uh, working with Bayanihan of the Desert, uh, Coachella Valley, um, Immigrant Dignity, and Golden Sands Mobile Home Residents uh, uh, group. And we, um, I did send an email to Mr. David and to the Planning Commission um, via email, our map, maps and thank yous and, and other recommendations. And so we do uh, want to reiterate um, with the Tranview Road and Eldorado Rosa Parks that it goes through R, R, R1D um, back to RGA6 and see if we could include it in the housing element. Um, and then uh, the Indian Canyon and Vista uh, Chino, thank you so much uh, for taking some of our recommendation to mix use zoning uh, in, in that area of East Indian Canyon, South Vista, along Palm Canyon Drive. Thank you so much. And then, yeah, just reiterating what uh, Mr. Dieter said about Corazon El Dorado, uh, around the Frontage Road in El Dorado, we would like to see the C1s be converted to mixed use zoning. Um, I think we did see maybe that it was in the land use, but I didn't see that potentially. I think it's still for discussion, but I didn't see it in the housing element, looking at the, uh, at the online map of the housing element. And, um, and yeah, I definitely want to see if um, some of the land, the, the city land inventory sites could be rezoned for the housing element. I think some of our recommendations were not included. Uh, Crescendo, if it could be R2 and above, the Boulders property, R3 and above, Gene Autry Trail property. We could definitely have high density or, or R2 for the, and, and all of these were advocating for very low income, low income and moderate income set of folks. And then the Cottonwood, Chocoella, Singa Valley foams, uh, we would love to hear more feedback of more uh, R2 and above on these vacant lots. For policy recommendations, because I know that's part of the housing element, we definitely want to reiterate some of the ideas uh, about the city playing a role in building community wealth, permanent affordability, house and home ownership, and support programs like mutual self-help housing program, uh, ending single family uh, zoning, um, uh, and uh, seeing if the city could play more so that there's more transportation corridors and investments in uh, Sunlight Transit Agency, strengthening the rec control ordinance beyond cost Contra Costa. And we have all these other recommendations and questions, uh, fair housing, because I know that's something that will be included. And so in those follow-up meetings, we definitely would like to be more engaged on the fair housing piece and the EJ piece. And there's a lot more that we uh, emailed to Mr. David and the Planning Commission, and uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Boris Grizzly. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Boris Grizzly, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee. Can you hear me? Profit organization committed to promoting the creation of good paying jobs, fair competition, and high quality construction industry standards. As the city continues to review and discuss the proposed draft housing element, we hope the city recognizes that this document should also plan for a more equitable society and take a more serious look to the issue of wage theft in the construction sector. In our day to day, we hear the stories of workers not paid for all the hours they work, who must give a part of their paycheck to a labor trafficker, who are paid time after time with bounced checks or told to just keep working and you will get paid only to be left hanging with empty promises. We see the schemes that shady contractors dream up to cheat workers, cheat competitors, and cheat taxpayers. Related to this is also the broader financial impact to all of us. A new UC Berkeley study, the public cost of low wage jobs in California's construction industry has noted that a significant number of workers are vulnerable to wage theft misclassification, and incomplete access to health care benefits. As a result, many construction workers and their families are forced to become enrolled in government safety net programs to meet their basic needs, like medical coverage and food stamps. Basically, we are all subsidizing the negative business practices of bad actors. This is lost money that could be spent on education, infrastructure, or public safety. As a housing element moves forward, we hope that the Planning Commission looks at possible safeguards to make sure workers building future projects are treated fairly with dignity, and that the city support responsible contracting practices in order to create good local careers that benefit the community as a whole. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Patrick Weiss. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not speaking for the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Committee of Courageous Resistance, but I am the chair of that committee. And so I'll be speaking for myself, not for the committee today to um, emphasize that. I wanna support Dieter Crawford's uh, suggestion about the Desert Highlands Tramview Road to change to R1 single family to RGA or multiple units. Also, uh, and between Tramview Road and Rosa Parks Road, rezoning recommendations, R1D lots back to RGA or six. Um, it's well known this is uh, an area where um, there's a large black population and we know of the history of Palm Springs that the black community was um, forced out of um, a part of Palm Springs, which is, is, you know, not good. And I think this is the least we can do to help that area of the city prosper and grow. And at the same time, allow them affordable housing. And thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Aaron Leader. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for your time to this, this evening. I appreciate it. I'm a uh, part-time resident of Palm Springs and my time there continues to grow as I'm able to uh, transition myself down there. I'm a real estate agent. I'm with the Otswith Land Trust. I also sit uh, as a director for the National Association of Realtors. And I think when I look at things globally or even just around, no city is ever really unhappy about removing, you know, open space, land for conservancy. They're not, because as things keep growing, these pieces become more precious. And it's also another thing to bring people to Palm Springs, which is an incredible tourist attraction, and more and more people are loving to come here. We've seen increase in housing right now at a high rate because so many people are finding their home there. So what will become more, more treasured is open space. And especially in regards to Bel Air Greens, some kind of miraculous things have been happening where you have five sellers and the Indians, the board, all looking at selling this land and being very happy about it that it's going to conservation. At the same time, we already have universities involved in the way that the land will be taken care of. It's something that will be, you guys will be so proud of and it is amazing our ability to raise money and to do these things. And what we're asking is just please don't change that while it is like the train has left the station and is going strong. And it's really an amazing thing that will happen as we continue to work with you and we continue to have this relationship, we are gonna create beautiful open spaces in uh, Palm Springs. And I think you're all pretty proud of what we were able to accomplish at Oswith Canyon. Can you imagine 144, 200 homes sitting in that area right now and the giant walls behind it? So everyone is thrilled that that's, you know, that land is being protected and there's more land to be protected. Even the land behind the Palm Springs Animal Shelter, uh, I believe that's boulders, you know, that should be conserved too. So that you can imagine the expansion of that successful program. There's so many wonderful things that happen in Palm Springs, but we've got to think of ourselves as holding on to this precious land for everyone to use and for everyone to enjoy. I sincerely appreciate your time tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ariela Gonzalez. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Hi there, uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I apologize for my connection. I am in the middle of nowhere right now. Um, but I am a biologist um, in Riverside County. I've been practicing in California for the last 15 years, and I came across um, these changes to uh, these land parcels, um, the, the Ballard Greens and the White Barter parcel, and it was 
the other folks that spoke about preserving uh, the land use, the current land use designation for these parcels, um, particularly Joan Taylor and Aaron, what he just discussed. Um, but, and it is in regards to the species that these parcels were in, were, were to protect. Um, the land use designation um, was already set in stone. And I, and I, and I do see there's more of a growing For people in Palm Springs and in all cities, um, but to go back and retract uh, the land use designation would be an embarrassment, and I think it would uh, really be a sellout for the city. Um, particularly, the Casey's June beetle is an endemic species; uh, it only exists in Palm Springs um, for both of these parcels. Um, well, for, for one. The, the one, uh, the Bellard Green, Casey's June Beetle was already found there on the property. Um, any mitigation efforts that were proposed for this species um, doesn't seem to to be adequate. It's it, it's an it's not adequate at all. Um, Excuse me. I, I please urge you. Casey's June Beetle property isn't before us tonight. That's before the city council tomorrow night. Okay. Yes. But I I I I, I urge you guys to to um to change the land use designation uh, for both these persons. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is David Lotze. And then the last person I have that who has requested to speak is Laura Mendoza. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak, please let me know via the chat or raise your hand. Thank you, Mr. Lotze. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking uh, as a board member for Oslo Land Trust uh, and also uh, as a resident of Los Compadres. Uh, I live about two blocks away from Bel Air Greens. Um, I won't repeat what my uh, colleagues have stated about uh, the uh, blow sand area by Whitewater, but I did want to emphasize uh, the area around Bel Air Greens. I'd like to keep it open space. Uh, that area was open space, obviously, when I moved here in 2010. And um, it's a beautiful area. If, if uh, even it, it's, it's been seriously blighted, obviously, since it closed. But uh, despite that, the wildlife has really taken over the area. And you can go up there, the fences are open now, and, and there are so many hawks and bird species, uh, plenty of bird watchers that go up there. Uh, obviously, Oswa Land Trust has some great plans working with uh, 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 UCR uh, Palm Desert to take this back, take this land and, and recreate a beautiful space for all residents to enjoy. And uh, so just wanna, um, emphasize that I uh, hope the Planning Commission does not rezone uh, Bel Air Greens, uh, keep it as open space, uh, we need that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Laura Mendoza. Hi, everyone. Um, this is gonna be fairly short and sweet. Um, I've moved here five years ago. And one of the reasons why I moved here was because there were so many open spaces in our community and I, I, I love them. And to see so much development happening already in all every space that is remaining open is very depressing um, and takes away from the charm of our city. But even more than my own personal um, feelings, I always worry about and care about the animals and they don't have a voice, so we have to be their voice. And we're living in this Anthropocene era where humans and our, our interests are robbing every other species of their, what I feel is their right to exist as well. And I just think it's, it's something that in, in our community, we, we have the opportunity to, to do something about. So preserving a beetle might seem ridiculous to some people, but it's absolutely important. I read something today that said, every time we lose a species, we break a life chain that has evolved over 3.5 billion years. So I think we have a responsibility to save 
all the species that we can in our community. And I think our experience of our community will be the better for it as well. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last person who has requested to speak is uh, Joanna S. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak, please let me know by raising your hand or letting me know in the chat. Otherwise, Joanna will be the Joanna will be the last speaker. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. I think the uh, proposed project for Bel Air Greens is too close to protected species. They are continually impacted by the development that we see on an ongoing basis in the community. I've been a resident here for 10 years, and as the last caller indicated, we've seen nothing but an increase in development. We as citizens need to protect our vanishing species as well as our desert lands. I think we can collaborate and save our lands for all to share think we also can find a balance between development and not continuing to threaten protected species. Please do not rezone Bel Air Greens. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Thank you all for speaking and the public comment period is closed. The next item before us is due business. It's 2A, the appointment of the Architectural Review Committee uh, members as part of the 2021 annual recruitment. The recommendation, which was discussed at our last meeting, was to reappoint Tom Josway, Tom Josie, Tom Jakeway, and John McCoy for terms ending in June 30, 2013, to reappoint Stephen Prohine and John Walsh for terms ending June 30th, 2024, and to reappoint Dan Thompson as an alternate member with a term ending June 30th, 2024. Uh, can I have, is there any discussion or can I have a motion? Uh, Commissioner Hirschbein. Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate what came out, what I uh, commented on, that uh, the planning director reached out to a couple of the applicants that aren't on this list to make sure that, you know, they haven't been discouraged from reapplying in the future. Can I make a motion to uh, accept the appointments? I'll second. Uh, can all in favor, can we call the roll please? Commissioner Song? Yes. Commissioner Lane? Yes. Vice Chair, I'm sorry, Chair Wormick? Yes. Vice Chair Mosey? Yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner mm -hmm. Lander? Yes, Commissioner Irvin. Commissioner Irvin, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes, I, I said yes. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. The next item is the discussion, and it's a discussion of three different items. The draft 2021-2029 housing element, the draft land use plan, and the proposed build out. Before we start, I'd like a, a comment from uh, Planning Director Fag. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've had some concerns from members of the Planning Commission as well as members of the City Council in terms of the time frame that we're bringing the housing element, the draft housing element to you and the time frame for making comments. Uh, I'd like you to know that if we had additional time, we would certainly like to extend this out. Uh, however, we are under state deadlines. Uh, I am a little unhappy the fact that the state has imposed the deadlines that they have on us relative to the pandemic. Uh, as you're aware, the emergency orders in the state were only lifted on June 15th. Uh, we're only five weeks away from that. In those five weeks, we've held four neighborhood meetings and a general community workshop on the housing element. So it's hard to take a housing element out to the community 
without being able to do public outreach in person. It's difficult to do that via Zoom. At the community workshop that we held last week, some of the most meaningful conversations I had with members of the public was after the meeting was over, standing by one of the maps and listening to their concerns and their input. Uh, a lot of times you don't get that type of input unless you're there in person, able to look at a map, uh, look at comments, et cetera. And so it was very important for us to do public outreach as part of this housing element update. But again, we are under a strict deadline from the state. Failing to meet those deadlines puts us in jeopardy of funding for programs and other things. And so it's very important that we meet that. So with that in mind, again, we're on a very short schedule trying to incorporate as much public input as we could in that short period of time that we had available to us while still giving you as the Planning Commission and City Council adequate time to review the draft document. The second thing that I'd like to say to you this evening is you'll notice on your agenda that we aren't asking you to take action on this item, nor is City Council being asked to take action on the item tomorrow night. The reason for that is that this is still a draft document. When we provide it to the state, to the Department of Housing and Community Development, we are providing them a draft document. They will review it and they will return comments back to us, we'll incorporate those comments. And at that point in time, you will have it on an agenda for a public hearing uh, and you will be able to then adopt the document. I, I want to be careful in saying that we have to have a pretty complete picture of what we're submitting at this point However, we still may be able to make minor modifications based on the changes that the state gives back to us. So again, you're not being asked to adopt a document tonight. You're being asked to give us comments on a draft document, as is the city council, and that you will be seeing this again in the near future once the state has reviewed it. Uh, so Madam Chair, those were my comments in terms of the time frame and the fact that we really wanted to do uh, additional public outreach on the housing element and to interact with the community on that. Uh, and that concludes my comments. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Newell, who will lead us through the discussion this evening. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Fagg and Commissioners. So, um, I, I want to, uh, as part of my presentation, make sure that uh, it's not me just presenting the information like it was with our last. where if, if we don't have adequate land, we're rezoning to accommodate um, housing uh, within the city. Uh, cities are re also required to have a buffer above the arena allocation numbers. So our buffer uh, is going to be about 15 to 30% above the 2,500 number here. So um, I'll get into some of the specifics of that in just a moment. Um, but the uh, 
but our, our strategy to, uh, that we've laid out in the, the proposed housing element, um, we believe will accommodate uh, these numbers, the 2,500 uh, unit count for all income levels for the city, uh, for residents. Um, and it's going to be through a combination of projects that have been approved and are planned for um, during the, the eight year cycle. It'll also include accessory dwelling units that we have seen a steady increase in the past few years. So we project that through ADUs, we can meet some of our lower and moderate income levels um, during the eight year period. We have recommended uh, rezoning, or excuse me, we have recommended that some of our currently vacant sites are, which are currently zoned um, for multifamily can also accommodate some of our lower and moderate income level affordability housing levels. Uh, and then lastly, we've, uh, we're recommending, or the steering committee recommended um, a couple of sites to be rezoned for high density residential and medium density residential. So when you see what, what you see here on the screen, obviously is the table showing which various affordability levels we expect can accommodate our housing needs for the eight year cycle ranging from the lower income levels to the moderate and above moderate income levels. As you can see, generally our above moderate income levels haven't really been a problem. We've been able to accommodate um, much of the, the need for above moderate. It's really been, the difficulty has really been the lower and moderate income levels. So um, as I mentioned, the total that we have to plan for is 20, just over 2,500. Through the approved projects that we have, um, um, either entitled or under construction, we expect that we'll have about 2,700 units, and that then I'm sure there will be additional projects um, that uh, would accommodate more units. But um, through approved projects and projects that we have under construction, that's what we expect. Um, most of those are in the above moderate income levels. We do have a few projects um, that would accommodate some of the, the lower and moderate income levels. And those are all described in our housing element. Uh, in terms of the accessory dwelling units, we've seen, uh, as I mentioned, a steady increase. And we do know that the state has allowed um, cities and municipalities to use accessory dwelling units to accommodate some of the lower uh, or moderate income levels in cities and counties. So we project that we would have about 500 total units during the eight year cycle. Um, and at, at the discussion that we had last, uh, last week, we talked about maybe strengthening how we um, can facilitate ADUs. So that's something that we can look at as part of our policies and, and programs. Um, and then, from our currently zoned sites, we expect that we'll have about 850 units um, from sites that are generally zoned multifamily. And so again, these are all described, how we get there is all described within our housing element. We've got a couple of sites that I'll go through in just a moment that we, uh, that we talked about last time, but just to refresh uh, your memory about, I'll go through that too. Um, but this gets us above the, the 2,500 number uh, with, a, with a good size buffer here. Um, and in table 331, we have identified all of these sites and how we plan to uh, accommodate the arena. So this is a map that's part of our part of the housing element. Uh, it does show all of the approved projects in orange that we have, we know are going to accommodate um, housing during the eight-year cycle, or we expect can accommodate them, accommodate some of our numbers. The vacant sites also. Uh, are shown in uh, this kind of pink purple color uh, and that does those are all sites that are uh, undeveloped and can accommodate additional housing Mr. units. Mr. Newell are those it looks to me like those are not the approved sites for the above moderate but though uh, but those are the moderate and low income sites am I correct? That's correct yes. Thank you. Can you go through those for the uh, commission? Sure. So the starting from probably the top here, off of Indian Canyon, north of Tramview, 
Uh, there's a portion of the former College of the Desert site that was um, that surrounds the James O. Jesse Desert Highland Unity Center. Um, it's undeveloped land. A portion of it we think can accommodate um, some higher density residential, which we've shown here. And so this is currently designated uh, school. And so this whole area we plan, uh, we're planning to redesignate the land from what you see here is the, the blue here from uh, school designation to the higher density residential designation, as well as this medium density residential um, and then neighborhood commercial here near the corner. So that's the, and that was a recommendation we uh, received from the general plan steering committee. Uh, initially we, showed this orange area as a lower density, but per the steering committee's recommendations, we are now reflecting it as a medium density residential over here. Uh, David, is there any reason we can't have that be high density residential or why did they recommend away from that on the orange area? Uh, well, it was, so we, we showed it as low density and then we they suggested it be a higher or medium density. So we changed it to the medium density for their recommendations. Is there any reason that that couldn't go to high density to help meet the needs that we're faced with now? I mean, it certainly could. My, rec my rec recollection is that they didn't go to medium. It seems to me it, it should be a real focus on what we're looking at. Um, I think in the commission's mind, or certainly mine, we're looking for real solutions and real zoning as long as well as appeasing the state. And this area um, looks like it has great potential. Okay. I, um, I'm intrigued by the idea and I think it opens up a lot of um, capacity building. I have a question for the planner, so for David, between single family and high density, do you want a transition or a buffer so that you would step through single family to, uh, or a low density to medium density to high density, or are the adjacencies of low density and high density um, not, not, not problematic? Yeah, typically we do like to see um, uh, a step being down um, as you get into the lower density. So um, usually along the corridors, we typically see a higher density or a higher intensity of uses. So that's why the, the configuration was laid out in this fashion. Um, and then of course we have the area direct is the very low density. So um, it would be pretty stark difference between the very low density and the high density along this edge. Uh, it does not to say that we couldn't have some um, additional space to expand the high density to the west. Um, but again, I think it's really because of the, the kind of development pattern of the neighborhood it starts more intense and then goes to a lesser intensity. Um, and then uh, just so so people are aware, so the the medium density residential is a uh, is really a an R three or multifamily. Uh, designation. It does permit 6.1 minimum uh, density to a maximum of 15 dwelling units per acre. David, wouldn't it be possible, I, I, your, your point about um, the stark difference between, say, going to very high density, backing up to an existing neighborhood, wouldn't that be pretty easy to solve by just um, moving up in density uh, as we leave the perimeter of the area going toward the center. In this case, you know, in your recommendations or, or um, others' recommendations, you've, all the high density has been just moved to one corner, but couldn't we easily um, sort of fan out from the center being very high density, um, multi-family um, buildings, into uh, much less density, even down to single family, um, in order to have this uh, blend better into the existing community. But the, the, the zoning code already has a uh, 150 foot 
um, transitional setback between a lower density to a higher density. So uh, to Commissioner Robert's point is that this whole area should be um, high density. And then wherever the housing is composed, designed, planned against a single family or low density, those units would be guarantee one one story buildings. Yeah, there are certain um, standards in our zoning code to transition um, multifamily from adjacent single family zones. So that is uh, that is something that our zoning code does have within uh, within it. Um, David, also, uh, uh, there's a request by the community in Desert Highlands to up zone those some of those single family lots. And I'd like to see that as part of the recommendation as well, because I think these smaller lots uh, provide a lot of opportunity uh, for, for smaller developers to come in and, and densify that area with new housing. Correct, yes, yeah, so we did get, the, so the comment that we got from Desert Highland uh, was relative to some existing lots uh, that previously were multifamily within the El Dorado Boulevard area. Uh, and those were changed uh, to single family back when the city did the 93 general plan update. And so the, the request is to return that um, ability to have multifamily back for those lots. And that, that actually doesn't require us to change the actually designated. So it doesn't actually require that we make changes for, for El Dorado Boulevard, on, at least on the west side. Uh, that, that could be accommodated through a zone change, um, if that's in fact the, uh, the desire of the, uh, the residents in the neighborhood. Um, but they did have requests for some changes along, you know, between the Indian Canyon corridor and El Dorado, between Rosa Parks here and Tramview. So those requests uh, are really to, yeah, to change those designations uh, to allow mixed use or medium density residential. Um, so yeah, so no, the request, as I understand it, doesn't require any potential or any change to the designation on El Dorado on the west side, but it would require changes to this these two blocks. David, what I'm getting a sense from the commission is that they actually would like to go to higher density uh, right. residential, except in the buffer area, and also to accept recommendations of the Desert Highlands community regarding uh, El Dorado and Frontage Road. Mm -hmm. Am I correct on that? Well, yes. it, 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 was, it was also uh, Rosa Parks, as well as Tramview and Corazon as well. There was more, Looks like in the report it just has El Dorado, but if you listen to the community, the community also mentioned Rosa Parks as well as Tranview and uh, Corazon. And uh, Mr. Commissioner Irvin, does that it includes Tranview? Does it include Sunview, Palm, Palm Vista Drive, Bonaire, and uh, Avenida Circa? No, so it would be Tranview. It, no, it doesn't. It, it will be Tranview, El Dorado, uh, Corazon, and also uh, Granada. Did Dieter Crawford also suggest Rosa Parks as well? He had a very concise uh, group that um, Commissioner Irvin's bringing up, but I think there were even other areas, uh, including Rosa Parks, weren't there, Commissioner? I think yes, we'd have to ask Mr. Newell that question, but Mr. Irvin can also. Yeah, yes, he's it, been, it was, I believe, at the. It, it was Tranview as well. So there was maybe uh, three streets that were not included in there that were um, asked for. And that was El Dorado, that's Tranview, um, Rosa Parks, Corazon, and Granada. And so, then all of those so me, streets, were, all of those streets were once uh, RGAs, um, and they were switched over to um, um, our residential 
Um, they once were RGA6. So as we're looking at this, I'm sensing that we have agreement with what Commissioner Irvin is suggesting and also an agreement with this uh, College of the Desert area to be more of it to be high des density residential except for the buffer zones. And if I could add um, multifamily development as well, multifamily buildings, um, because we simply have the space in the former um, College of the Desert. The, the parcels in Desert Highlands are smaller and certainly offer more density. Um, but I think between the two areas, the Desert Highlands areas that um, Commissioner Irvine's brought up and COD, we should be able to solve many of the, the issues required by state, but more importantly, by our own city's desire to cr create um, affordable, um, affor not only affordable housing, but beyond. And, it, and higher density could also be moderate income housing in the form of apartment units. Right, and, and that's, uh, uh, Chair Wormack, I'm hoping we can talk a lot about apartments in this and talk about incentivizing, um, and, you know, maybe this is a subcommittee issue, but finding true real ways to incentivize the construction of apartments because they're needed and wanted. There was a huge article in the Wall Street Journal today about it, about um, investors and developers or investors buying up housing as rentals because there's such a need for rentals um, in the marketplace now. And we didn't need to be told that anyway. I, I, would, I would also like to uh, mention um, that we, we must be careful to not put um, a lot of anything in one specific area. So we, we have to be careful with that too, with putting all the apartments out there. Um, we already have a, a, a high crime uh, problem there in that community. Um, so we wanna be careful that we're not uh, bringing in a lot of low income apartments as well. Um, so from my opinion, the mix uh, of, of a little bit of uh, uh, residential housing uh, the mixture of apartments, uh, but a nice mixture, not just a, a, a wide range of just one, just bunching a, a bunch of uh, anything in one location, because we have to be careful with that. I agree with you. Would it make sense to have maybe the higher density extend further here towards, you know, maybe where the edge of the park is and keeping the remainder in DR? I don't know that we have to solve all that right now. I think you're just getting a lot of good comments. And, you know, the city council's made it clear. I've certainly heard from my colleagues on this commission that we really want to focus on this and come up with some real, real world solutions to our housing issues, which, based on your own report, David, are getting worse and worse. And I think that we're at a point where we can make a difference. Um, and come up with all the blends that are necessary to work within existing neighborhoods. I agree to not create um, islands of just one type of housing, but we have so many, the reason I like this area is there's so much more opportunity here than there is anywhere else in town because it's not overbuilt. And, uh, and, so, and so to me, that, that would definitely mean that we have to take a real, um, a strong look at it and make sure that we do the right thing um, when, when looking at that area. We have to make sure that, that like, like you said, that we don't have a large island of just one specific item, but we have to really make sure that once we do make that decision, that we're really looking out for the best interest of the community as well as that part of the town. And I think that's true of any area that we look at but I agree that it would be a concern here because we have such a big swath that we could actually develop. The, the difficulty is that David at some point is gonna to have to quantify it. But you know, that'd be helpful to know now 
David, what you specifically need from us at this point. What I heard you say at the top of this meeting was that you really need, and unless I misheard you, was that we need to deal with the state requirement and then bring this back to us. It would be helpful to know very specifically how detailed you need us to be right now. Sure. So part of the housing element is, well, part of establishing and creating um, the land or creating what we know is the residential areas of the city uh, has to be um, kind of more defined at this point because we have to, uh, and that's why we've incorporated the land use plan as a part of your review tonight. The land use plan obviously it includes not only commercial, industrial, um, but it, it also has residential. And that's why we need to define where our residential areas are, what the densities are. Uh, and from there, we can complete our environmental analysis that will have to be completed before you adopt the housing element. So that's why we're trying to kind of get some of the specifics cleared out today. Uh, what if we look at this area as 30% high-density residential and 70% um, medium-density residential, which will allow um, both small, you know, fourplexes, single-family homes, and then some higher-density residential. But we include a larger swath of, of high-density residential to be placed at some future time. I'm not sure if that's the right formula. Madam Chair, that seems like a reasonable solution. And by putting a percentage on it, what that does is allows us to work with the community uh, to determine how that might be distributed. So as Commissioner Irvin has indicated, we don't have just one type repeated over and over again, that there's a mixture of housing types. So by putting a percentage on it, I think that gives Mr. Newell uh, adequate numbers in terms of being able to determine the impacts associated with that for the environmental review uh, while giving the community some flexibility and some input in terms of what goes where. Are we are we all, all right with that as a, rec, as a comment and recommendation? Um, I, I am in principle. Um, it's just the percentage itself, which I guess can shift. Um, it's hard to, in my head, to, to you know, come up with a number or understand a number without a plan, really. So I guess it's sort of a moving target. On the surface, that sounds great. Is it the right mix? Is it the right percentage? How do we know? Well, I think it's a target. It's a target that the planners will use to try to figure that out. I don't think it's, it's in stone. It's not, you know, codified. It's a target at this point. I also would like to uh, mention too the the uh, NCC on there too. If we can add that, there's a little percentage in there as well. The what, Commissioner? The the, the um the, I think that there's an neighborhood NCC. commercial. Yeah, the neighborhood commercial. Um, I would like to add a little oh. percentage in there as well. That's the little tiny slither that's right there on the corner. Is that adequate for what you're, you've been looking for for the neighborhood serving commercial? That uh, looks like it's 5%. Yeah, it, it looks like right it's now not, it, but, but, but we, we can, you know, we can work with that. I, I mean, it, the, the whole goal is, is to work on the food desert and also get some banks down there in that part of town. So, you know, if we can maybe work on, uh, getting some markets or something down there, you know, that, that would be fine. So um, maybe a little more, a little less, it's fine. And and also the part about upzoning some, some of the existing streets in there. Right. So we've, I think we've, we've come to as far as we can get with this section, knowing that it's a moving target. But we give Mr. Newell something to work with. Ms. Alanian? Yes, I do have one, another thing I want to suggest, and that's the open space in park. Although the uh, size of it might be appropriate for that area, the concentration of it all in one location is going to, now that we're going with a higher density, 
you're going to have kids uh, and families that want to go out and play, and the parents are not going to feel comfortable sending them to play in the park because the park's so far away. If that same um, area were divided in two or three, uh, you'll see other parks around in the neighborhoods or in the surrounding areas are more like parklets and more convenient and more proximate to the actual housing. And that might be a more effective way to make sure that families are comfortable with their kids playing um, a little bit a little bit removed from their home but not so far away that they can't see them here and keep an eye on them let's let's say uh, 60 percent uh, MDR 30 percent high density residential and an additional 5% NCC and 5% open, additional open space in small parklets. What is staff's recommendation on this as well? I mean, Madam, I think the neighborhood commercial is extremely important and very much like Commissioner Elaine just suggested, maybe the neighborhood commercial needs to be split up across this area as well. Um, so again, we don't have everything centralized in one little corner. So I, I'd be very interested in staff's recommendations for formula on this. Let me jump in very quickly. On the green parcel, the open space, there are some restrictions on that space. The majority of it is the James O. Jesse uh, Desert Highland Community Center and Park. Um, and I believe that there are some restrictions on the uh, undeveloped portions of that park as well. So we can't really distribute it throughout the neighborhood, but your comment is a good one in terms of making sure that wherever we have higher density housing, there also needs to be open space adjacent to it, and to it uh, access to trails and things like that. On the second comment relative to the neighborhood community commercial, uh, remember that there are a number of undeveloped parcels also along Indian Canyon, just immediately south of that, that are designated for commercial use that can accommodate neighborhood commercial. While I think everyone would agree that we'd like to see neighborhood commercial in the center of the neighborhood, uh, sometimes from a market standpoint, that becomes a little bit difficult to develop and lease where it doesn't have the traffic numbers going by it. Um, I think as long as we provide a percentage of the commercial, um, we can look at flexibility as we work with the neighborhood in terms of where that might be placed. And so I appreciate the commission giving us percentages. And I think the percentages that you've given us uh, is something that we can work with in terms of the ultimate numbers. And then, as I had mentioned before, uh, working with the community to determine where that might be most appropriate. So, Director Fagg, if we're saying 60, 30, 5, and 5, does that work? Yes. Does that, is that just for a target? Does that work for everyone? Yes. Yes. Commissioner yeah. Sumner? Okay, good. Okay. All right, let's move to the next site. The next site that uh, we've identified as a candidate site to achieve some of the lower or moderate income levels is a five and a half acres of land at the southeast corner of Via Oliveira and North Palm Canyon Drive. Uh, this is, as you can see, a number of parcels. Uh, there is mostly one ownership. I, there, I think there are actually two. What number is that on our map? That is... Is it 27A, 27B? It's 13, 14, 15, and 16. Oh, but if you're referring to the pinpoint site, it's 27B. 27B. Okay. So that would... Uh, so that would be a change um, from mixed use to high density residential. So this is the layout as it is now uh, with the mixed use. A portion of it was already high density residential. 
And so the proposal is to change it to high density residential. And this is in between Indian and uh, Highway 111? Yep, correct. South correct. of Via Oliveira. Okay. Any issues with this? No. Seeing none, uh, let's move along. Okay. Um, yeah, and so those are really the, the, the two primary sites that re require uh, revision. Um, so as I discussed, we're looking at vacant sites uh, to make sure that you know, the sites we've chosen have adequate infrastructure or the appropriate infrastructure and services. Um, obviously, the sites that we've identified are, are uh, have all of these things available to it. Uh, we're also looking at ADUs. As I said, we we expect to we project about 500 ADUs to be built during the next eight year period. Um, and so again, the six acres of land that we've identified would help us achieve our arena number as well as the buffer that we need. And the um, other parcels that you're looking at for the arena numbers, is there anything else we need to review? No, so these don't require any change of zone. These are already vacant sites that have that are currently designated for multifamily uh, or high density, high density or medium density. So they don't require that we do any modification to the land use plan. Madam Chair, I have a couple of questions regarding that. Go ahead, please. What, what are the current land use designations for boulders and crescendo? See, those are still showing as a state residential. Both of them? You sure? Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, are those, so are, do the arena numbers include those properties, Crescendo and Boulders? No, they don't. Okay. No. Good to hear. And then later on, I'm going to ask if I would have a recommendation that we um, change the land use designation on both of those parcels to open space. One of the open spaces, I don't know if it would be parks and recreation or it would be mountain. So I don't know if now's the time to say that or later. Why don't we go into that later? I think we want to deal with the arena numbers. There are several items like that. I think there were also the items that uh, they weren't in our packets but the items that Joan Taylor mentioned of turning, of changing the land use designations on some of the parcels that have gone to, um, uh, have become open space, conservation open space, including Shadow Rock, uh, some of the Palm Hills areas, uh, Oswit, um, and just confirming those changes yes. that have happened. In fact, I was going to suggest that the Palm Hills uh, land use designation be changed to Open Space Mountain. But again, we can deal with that later if you'd like. I think we should deal with that later. Okay. Because it isn't something we need to do right now. It goes into the land use plan. I see. Okay. So let's continue. So um, in terms of the arena numbers, I think... David, is it fair to say that we need to do nothing for um, over moderate because we have to we have more land already committed, and that our real focus is uh, I I'm not sure that we have enough focus on the moderate house, and I join Commissioner Roberts in being concerned about being able to do more apartments and. Uh, the land use element doesn't focus on that necessarily. Okay, yeah, so the, the moderate um, income uh, levels here, yeah, it looks like mostly it's it was fairly evenly distributed between approved well, approved projects probably less than what we expect to get from accessory dwelling units, the current vacant sites, and then the sites to be rezoned. But um, 
you know, we can look at the policies and the goals to see what what uh, things that we think could help us achieve more moderate income level units um, and the programs that we have to you know, facilitate that that sort of uh, product type. Will that discussion come later? Yeah, so that's kind of uh, if if the if we've kind of looked at some of the specifics, you know, the site specific details, and then how we're you know the strategy that we're using to get to the numbers that the state has given us, uh, we can start delving into the goals and policies. And I think uh, Madam Chair, we wanted to get into some of those specifics. Um, I had a quick question you know, regarding uh, something in the housing element. That's before we get to goals and policies. Sure. It's on page one twenty nine. Um, it's the second paragraph where it says, all of these projects have been deed restricted entirely for low income households. And I'm just curious, how do you enforce deed restrictions? How, are they, how exactly does this work? 129? Yeah. The second paragraph, it's the last sentence of the second paragraph. All these projects have been deed restricted entirely for low income households. The Deed restrictions, uh, Commissioner Maruzzi, it depend on the programmed money who would be repaid money. Uh, uh, municipalities programs uh, if the restrictions weren't followed. So it would be recalls of loans and it would be a, a violation of investor agreements typically. Um, and typically, as somebody who's both built and operated affordable housing, people don't go out of their way to abuse those restrictions. Okay, that's good to hear. So as long as you feel comfortable that, that these various deed restrictions will be enforced five, six years down the line once the project is completed and they're, for, they're put up for sale. Yeah, hey, absolutely. They'll, they'll be enforced. Good. Thank yeah. you. It's quite common that those are 55 year um, requirements. And the old HUD ones were 30 years and most of the, and some of the um, recommendations we have are re-upping them with some of our trailer parks, their, um, their rent restrictions that the municipality enforces. So they're different, different mechanisms for enforcement. But, uh, typically, they get enforced. I mean, do you think that uh, some sort of a design technical for this document? Um, yeah, I would say that's probably too tactical. I think just under state law, it, you know, the projects that they're referencing in Table Three Twenty Four, those all all those projects have uh, required funding, uh, public assistance. Uh -huh. So, and as a part of that requirement is that you know they stay affordable um, through a deed restriction. Um, and typically it's 55 years or longer. Okay, good. I just, it seems so important. I just thought it should be emphasized in some way. And, and single family self-help housing has its own set of restrictions. Uh, there's some municipal programs that are, you know, different, but generally there's, there's enforcement. Okay, good. Thank you. So, um, if we're comfortable moving on from the arena strategy, we can delve into the goals and policies. I think we talked about doing some of that uh, at the, the previous meeting, uh, Madam Chair. Right, and I think uh, what I wanted to do is go through, I think we start, hold on, we're starting at page, is it 150? 150, I think it starts at page 156. And I just wanted comments from people on goals and policies. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, so just, just so we're all aware that, so we have five main uh, broad goals. And then from these goals, we uh, indicate, you know, number of policies. Um, and based on those policies, we create the programs which are shown um, below the um, or, or after the, the the goals and policies and the um, implementation actions of the document. So the implementation actions are on 165. 
the goals start on 154, 155. You know, on page 155, I, it brings up Palm Hills right there. It says other areas outside the urbanized areas, such as Palm Hills and Chinacone, are limited and require a different housing strategy. So I would suggest the housing strategy be uh, desert or open space. What's the other one? Mountain. Mountain or conservation. I just don't think those are good examples to use. I had, uh, I have the same comments. Uh, at this point, we don't need to take any land out of open space to create housing. And I suggest that we don't allude to that in this document. I agree. Um, so that the paragraph, this, the second from the last paragraph on this should be changed. Yes. I, I think the importance of the, of, sorry, go ahead. The second to the last paragraph relative to housing in Palm Hills and Chino Cone. And those were saving those were there huge community movements in our community. Yes, indeed. Going to um, I, I have a couple of policy points I'd like to bring up. Certainly, but let's go page by page. Well, I'm not sure where it falls into the page actually. Uh, so let me just bring them up and then maybe we can talk about them if there's a particular clause that I missed. But, um, you know, I brought up the point about uh, pre-approving a, a set of working drawings for a, a ADU. Hold on, let's stop there because there's gonna be a whole page on ADUs. Okay, I'll hold on that one. And then the other one, and I, again, I'm not sure if it's covered specifically in the document, I can't remember, but parking requirements and the cost associated with providing on-site parking at, at certain levels and how that impacts affordability. I, I think that fits into the items that have been missed in the way of goals of reducing parking requirements to the extent that they uh, impede the development of low and moderate income housing and reviewing that. So that would be a suggestion that we add that. My specific suggestion there is really to look at three three bedrooms and more and not require more than two parking spaces uh, because it it will uh, impede developers. Well, but if you get into um, special needs housing or elder housing, there might be a much reduced rate of parking. And we saw that on the project on Palm Canyon that we've approved already. So I think it needs a more sort of comprehensive look to understand what the costs are associated with it, if it's a benefit, and then come back with a recommendation on how to how, how you would how you would proceed with that if it's necessary or desirable. So for the director, can you just note that we think that there should be some policies in terms of parking with housing, both with uh, special needs and elder housing, but just policies uh, to potentially reduce some of the parking requirements. Do yes, it. we can go ahead and do that and put that in there generally. Keep in mind for the general plan, you typically don't specify parking ratios in the general plan. You follow up and do that in your zoning code, which we will be doing here shortly. Um, but we'll go ahead and put that as a policy to tailor parking specifically to the type of residential use and right. looking at parking and how that impacts the cost of units. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to come up with a specific ratio at this point. I just wanted yeah. to put it out there. Um, and Is, also, I have another policy. Can I just... I, I'm assuming we have general agreement because no one's spoken against it. Yes. Yes, I, I would suggest that that goes in our implementation. One of the implementation activities is to review the parking requirements for all types of housing to determine, uh, ascertain what can be do that, done to minimize the amount of parking required and maximize the amount of housing units provided. I echo what Commissioner Lee just said, and I think it would be way too complicated to try to work these things out right now, but I think. Yeah.
we're all in agreement on that. And Commissioner Land, in case of, of the director didn't capture all of it, would you send him an email with your comments? I will certainly do so. I have a comment on page 156. It's HS1.5. This it relates to um, non-traditional locations for multifamily housing, including underutilized commercial sites. We those the RENA numbers cannot include that those suggestions, correct? It can't be multi-use, it can't be non-traditional locations. So this is a goal, but not something that can be implemented because of the RENA issue. We can implement it. Um, as a matter of our own preference, because we have the goal. So if we choose to say we want to modify our commercial districts to allow housing um, where appropriate or underutilized sites or you know, whatever we, we think is appropriate, this goal allows us to do that. Um, we just can't say, oh, because we're going to start allowing apartments in existing commercial centers that, um, you know, that's how we're going to get to our affordable levels. Because okay. I just think it's a really important item and I don't exactly know how to emphasize it beyond just this one in entry. We can develop uh, implementation steps on this. Great. I had another um, uh, couple of things and I don't know if it pertains specifically to the general plan, but it does pertain to housing affordability, which is uh, short term vacation rentals and if they've had an inflationary effect on housing costs and what that is, and if they have, what should be the city's response? I don't know that that, does that go into the housing element? What we might do is have general language that talks about single family residences for other uses and preserving them for rental and ownership. Um, I think if we're very generalized about it, uh, as part of our implementation strategy, we can recommend that the city council look at vacation rentals and how that impacts it. So again, just very generally, we can talk about it. And then uh, in terms of implementation of the general plan, have the city council look at vacation rentals specifically. Um, finally, I think for policy, um, you know, there's been some talk in other municipalities about upzoning R1 areas. Uh, some large municipalities have done away with R1 zoning entirely. And I'm wondering if there's any appetite to upzone certain R1 areas in the city to maybe R2 uh, or even higher. Um, and particularly where the lots are larger that could accommodate two dwelling units on a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly that uh, we have seen that trend um, in states and other uh, municipalities, some in California. Um, so that is certainly a policy uh, matter that uh, you know, as the planning commission can recommend and the council can consider. I was wondering how the other commissioners felt about that. It seems like there's an awful lot of uh, open space in this report that's in section 14, but it relates to the specific plan for for section 14. So, I mean, if we suggested upzoning some of the land on within section 14, that's something we can't really do, right? Correct. Because that's an awful lot of open land is right within section 14. It's all mostly already medium or high density residential. Is it? As opposed to single? Okay. So it's it's hard to tell in this chart where exactly that is. But okay. We've actually, because of the auxiliary dwelling units, to some extent, we have upzoned the R1 districts. Well, to an extent, but it's only a percentage of the of the of the principal dwelling unit, so they wind up being pretty small. Uh, I'm thinking about two units of approximately the same size on a, in existing neighborhoods. In existing neighborhoods, 
initial house has already been constructed and it's kind of hard to suddenly make room for a second one of the same size on the same lot. Well, there might be teardowns if you did that. And some of the larger lots, you can sort of get an, you know, if you look at Google Earth, there's big areas that would accommodate a second dwelling unit. Commissioner um, Hirschbein, where, where did you see that at? Um, where do they do that? In, in, no, no, what, in what cities uh, have you sent, seen that being done, or states? Well, I think Minneapolis abolished R1 zones. I know Seattle's done something along those lines. Oregon, I, I think Portland and Oregon. Portland. 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 No. And, okay. and there has been this, there has been paper written how it is the last R1 is the last way of keep, of continuing with nimbyism. Um, so it, for for I I am in big support of um, Commissioner Hirschbein's suggestion, um, but in order for it to be successful, I think it needs to be presented well. So yes. um, so for example, um, is the is the baby step to say all new vacant R1 uh, should be considered as R2, and then look at the existing R2 with existing structures, more of a survey and a data collection of what could be done, you know, to install an, or to build or design or plan for another home. Yeah, I, so you're taking incremental steps to get there. But I would, I, I would like to uh, get get the experiment, not the experiment, but I would like it to go to city council so that they do have this in front of them. That so extremely like we can say something to the effect of study and consider uh, up zoning where it may be appropriate in single family neighborhoods um, as either a policy uh, or an action item uh, and then as part of the implementation strategy for the general plan, we would probably have a separate set of meetings and discussion on that issue and present that to the city council. Because one, one, other, one other thought I had was that it, it just goes to the next R1 with higher density, right? So if it was just R1C, then it could be R1, um, six, RG6000 or you know, just one more, as another sort of baby step to get everybody to digest this. Uh, that could be another um, way of moving towards more density within infill. I like that better. Yeah, I think baby steps are important. It's gonna, it could be m misrepresented to the public. And I think it could cause concern amongst people who think that suddenly there's gonna be all these apartment buildings in their neighborhood needs to be carefully explained. So I, I had one more, which it's sort of, I think in between these policies. Um, so when when we say uh, we wanna support in, in uh, very well positioned areas, high density, as you know, a medium density for, um, special need housing with studios and one bedrooms is a very different composition for medium density housing for family. Um, the units would be one bedroom or single use uh, studios versus up to three or four bedroom apartments. So how in the general plan could we say that we understand that it's not one size fit all. And so when it does come to higher densities, that the count or the size of bedroom, then the count of bedrooms um, are considered and therefore there's a 20% uh, higher density consideration when the uh, number of bedrooms are limited to zero or one. Because we can't do it in zoning, it has to be more in the general, I mean, in the housing element that allows that flexibility. I like that, but I think I'd rather hear from David and Flynn on that in terms of whether that's doable. 
So I, I think the the challenge that we might run into is that it potentially could disincentivize people from building larger units. So if, for instance, you had a project that had 15 dwelling units per acre, you have, um, you know, that's kind of the max you have. There's definitely density bonuses that people can request if they're providing lower income uh, units. Uh, and the more units, the more density that they would get. Uh, so there is some incentive there to, you know, for those projects that are providing affordable housing already within our code to accommodate um, you know, more density. The, uh, but the, but the, I guess my only concern would be that we might disincentivize more family sized units. Uh, if we say, if you're building one bedroom or studio units, you can do more, and that might be more um, financially incentivizing for a developer. Uh, the, but the argument is we're not changing the baseline, right? Medium is up to 15, um, and you know, high is up to 30. We're saying that when the composition of unit and unit mix is with smaller number of bedrooms, that that's where they can get um, more units. Uh, the, the the issue has been that in many cases for uh, special need housing, um, we have to many, I mean, uh, people in density housing, they have to go to density bonus just to get the higher number of units for studios and one bedrooms for special need housing. Let's, we'll need to chat with our consultant to see how we might be able to incentivize that. If I understand correctly, again, this is primarily for special needs housing where there's a smaller unit size that's required. And consequently, the intent would be to allow greater density for that type of special needs housing. Also veteran housing, senior housing. Senior housing. Okay. Student housing. Okay, let's, if you'll let us look at that a little bit more closely with our consultant. What's, um, can we continue to go through this unless people have specific items? Do you want to go up to like page 168 or would you rather do it a different way? I'd like to go to page 158. I'm still there. Um, the we're talking about preserving the supply of mobile home parks and we've no in no place because that's our most affordable housing model we've in no place talked about exploring the possibility of adding additional mobile home unit and i don't know if that's possible on any of the land we have Would it even be allowed under current zoning? I, I think that's the point is that we should look at that um, as allowing additional mobile home units, uh, either in existing parks or allow the development of new mobile home parks. Wouldn't that be considered high density housing at single level? It's very specialized, so it might not. It's governed by HCD as opposed to, but I think allowing, Flynn, am I right on that? To a certain degree, but there's also local controls that we have in place that as Commissioner Roberts suggests, we may need to relook at the zoning code in terms of the restrictions that we have on mobile home park density uh, and uh, allowing existing parks to expand. So I, I think your comment is a good one and we can look at that relative to policies and then follow up an implementation in amending our zoning code. Uh, I would also like to go to page 160 HS 3.9 and we had talked about um, new design standards, but I think if we implemented some design standards 
that allow for more accessibility, formally for more accessibility, um, we wouldn't have to retrofit as many units. So wider doorways, one larger bathroom, um, you know, fewer steps. So basically design standards for accessibility that can be more universal. And I, I don't mean by that raising every light switch or recreating the kitchens, but just um, size, I guess, sizing doorways and and uh, keeping homes level so that wheelchairs can always be used. Are you referring to uh, new buildings or for retrofits? New buildings. Looking at design standards for new units. Are those uh, public or uh, or single single family or the whole housing type range? Because when it comes to um, a, a rental housing, uh, the federal law is pretty rigid. Explicit. Explicit, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but when it comes to single family homes um, or, or duplexes or so on, um, I, I guess what, uh, uh, what I'm wondering is, when the um, ADA rules are established, how does the general plan have a overseeing, um, you know, policy that should be written separately? I, I think we can, I mean, we have, we discuss our, um, we have goals and policies that discuss special needs housing. Uh, it, it certainly could be a program to explore design standards for accessibility um, on new buildings. And, you know, that could result in an ordinance or not, just depending on the results of what we find. I have a question going back to mobile home parks. Um, <clears throat> is there anything uh, in terms of the general plan uh, that we're looking at that we can mention or put into play something about the uh, maintaining existing mobile home parks to a level of basic habitability. Um, you know, that Golden Sands Park is woefully under maintained and um, there doesn't seem to be any movement to improve it. And uh, is there anything in the general plan that we can put in that would encourage that to happen? I'm looking at on page 158, policy HS 2.3, talking about enhancing the character of neighborhoods. Um, I don't know if that might be the appropriate place, but somewhere in terms of talking about neighborhood quality, uh, we could include language about the quality and appearance of mobile home parks as well. Uh, Director Fang, if you jump down to H2.5, I think it's covered right there. Oh, okay. I, I think what we might do is just call out that it applies to mobile home parks as well as apartments and other forms of housing. Can we more refine that later? I think that um, getting into housing types like that seems like they would benefit from having more specific criteria. Um, but it seems to me they fall into the very affordable uh, form of housing as well as high density where they have up until now. Um, I mean, I like where you're headed. Uh, where, um, what commissioners have brought up, but it seems to me that would be something that would benefit from some more review as well, so we can refine that, leave better tracks. 
Yes, and remember, remember that the uh, city does not have jurisdiction within the mobile home parks that the state steps in there. For instance, if you wanted to step up code compliance and uh, or something, make sure that people maintain it's not within the city's purview. Right. As, uh, do you know? Do you know why that is? Why the state reserves on that specifically? Um, the chair might have a better understanding of why than I do. I just know that it is. Oh, and look, we have our city attorney. You you read my mind. I was just about to say that the, the state has put themselves in the purview of the mobile home parks as to why. I think it was because a lot of cities maybe were not, um, they were kind of dealt with differently than resident, like apartments or otherwise. So as far as how mobile home parks are regulated and done, it is a matter of statewide concern. And so cities have very limited ability um, that they're granted through that state, the state ordinances or state um, statutes, sorry. So this is a matter that we should look at and figure out how we can help. Uh, we do have at least one mobile home park that we know is not, is not being maintained to any um, to decent stand, to decent habitable standards. That's the one I was thinking about specifically. Yes. And see where we could help make that a better community, um, not only for the current residents, but as a concept for future residents. And that can be done outside of the general plan, both in um, enforcement and just dealing within this the state statute. So it doesn't necessarily need to be contained within the general plan for the city to be proactive in enforcing either the municipal code where it can be or the state, you know, encouraging and going down the process of how to enforce it through the state, state statutes. So that's the process of working with the owner of the land. Correct. And through the city um, enforcement ability. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Of course. And Chair, if we finish discussion about that, uh, since we were just brought back to page 158, I do have a comment, another comment there. Please. Okay. Um, item HS 2.9, the last one, talks about ensuring that proposals for converting apartments into condominiums are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. I suggest that we need very much stronger language there uh, so that we discourage the conversion of uh, rental apartments in the ownership units. I, I think it's, it, it, we've had a couple of people recognize it's in the best interest of the community to retain rental uh, apartments and a supply of them and anything that we can do to make it uh, difficult or have great control over any proposed conversion into ownership is a good thing, my opinion. I would agree with that. I would too. Generally, do we have agreement with that? I, I agree with that, but if we're gonna go down that road, I'd love to go fuller with it. Rather than, you know, I'd like to use sugar and vinegar with that and create again, some great policy and incentives to build new ones. Um, you know, conversion of older apartments may be a great way to create affordable housing for first time buyers. Having said that, I completely agree that we don't want to diminish our rental housing stock. Um, but I'd love to see us more focus on coming up with ways to get apartments built. Because I think we're finally in an environment where they make more sense. I agree with incentivizing. I think that's a good idea. I uh, have seen too many examples of the conversion, uh, which seems in theory to be a good idea to get first time home buyers in there, but that's, it turns out to be a bad thing for the home buyers. Uh, it turns out to be a very lucrative thing for the owner and a bad thing for the buyers. But yes, whatever we can do to incentivize this new construction. I and Commissioner, I fully agree with you on putting in real teeth to keep that from happening at any level. Um, 
it, it would need to benefit everybody and not just the owners or the developers. And I, I'd love to see us really focus on some of that. It just hasn't been done yet. Yes, I'm not sure that the general plan is the place to put in the real teeth, but the concept that's laid out here, uh, I would suggest that we discourage conversion rather than make sure that they're considered. Um, then, Madam Chair, to Commissioner Roberts' point, we'll also include language about incentivizing the construction of new apartments as where it would fit appropriately within the general plan. And we'll include um, miscellaneous point points starting. Yes. It appears that there is consensus okay. among the commissioners. Um, does, I'm on page 161, and it's the second, it's the last sentence under, under conservation. And it says it will be increasingly important to establish guidance for the protection and thoughtful integration of development into and it's talking about the mountains. And I just would like to uh, sentence. I don't, at this point, we don't need to go into our, uh, our environmental areas. Understood. Sort of consistent through the document. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Chair Wormuth, also on the next page, HS, 4.2 uh, talks about that as well. And it should be, it should be, the last line should be stricken without appropriate environmental review and approvals. That should be stricken. Already required by law. I think. Yes. Well, I'm saying prohibited. So you just delete the words without appropriate environmental review and approvals. Correct. I like that. And if we can go back for a quick sec, um, 160 on item HS 3.2. Uh, it starts with assist in funding the development of transitional permanent supportive housing. I suggest that we say uh, assist in identifying funding for or support the development or something. If we say in our general plan that we're gonna assist, it sounds like we're providing financial assistance and I don't think the city's, it should be set up to, to have that used against them. I agree. On 162, uh, some of these, and I don't know, this is probably a question for David. Um, some of these, basalt, these, these, excuse me, uh, policies are already required under law. Um, National pollutant discharge elimination system. That's already going to be done anyway. Is there a reason to include this as a policy? Does it help us to to restate? Uh, and like the previous one was. Uh, talking about you have to go through environmental review and approvals. That has to be done anyway. Is it a good good thing to restate it or does it just make it a long-winded document? I would suggest it is a good thing to restate it because this document will go into many hands and other commissions and boards and they might not know the state okay. law okay. on that okay. So I think again, we're, we're leaving good tracks. And if we're all redundant, you know, as I'm looking ahead, uh, um, you know, like 165, you know, we already have financial incentives and there's already verbiage in there about hotel conversions. But I think this is a, a, a living document that people are gonna be using locally. Well, I'm also I was thinking about encouraging green building practices, for instance, HS 4.3. Yeah, we do have laws about that, Title 24 and so forth. But I think we should encourage green building practices beyond what the current laws are. And I'm not saying require them, it just is encourage them. 
I agree with that. Uh, HS, Which goal was that? Sorry. HS 4.3. Wasn't, wasn't there some a sustainability input in, in this? Yes, uh, we had a sustainability commissioner Friedman who's, who has provided um, a list of items that he I saw that. Did he Did that come up in this one? Because this is something that certainly he's real interested in. I don't think he commented on this. He was commenting more on the water usages. Uh, if you look at the list that he provided, his comments were all good, and I think yes. we, should, we should adopt them. Um, but HS 4.4, which is water resources, there, if we could adopt sustainable practices regarding construction and water usage um, and look further than what we currently are doing, I think it would be good. I, I know that um, in my development, which is 550 homes, there is no requirement that the hot water on demand systems are recirculating. And it, it basically has people using hundreds of additional gallons of water per month, maybe, maybe per day to get hot water recirculated. And I, I think I think there should we should be looking at sustainable practices in construction of new units to reduce water usage. So it, it, instead of the word encourage, is it practice? Or uh, implement, uh, and the same thing would apply for 4.4. Mm -hmm. And I think what we want to do is encourage not only meeting of, uh, I think several people pointed out that there are standards uh, that we have to meet according to the state. What we want to encourage uh, is the elevation beyond or surpassing the sustainable practices required. Yeah, and to Commissioner Roberts' point, this is a document that's going to be around for a while, and so these standards are going to get more and more stringent. And I think we should we should indicate that uh, we want to be out in front of those. Well, the word is exceed. Then uh, that's the word. Word, yes. Thank you, Commissioner Song. I think our uh, I think that's a great uh, comment. So three, four point three, and four point four would be and uh, encourage and exceed where possible. I'm sure our attorneys would appreciate that. And thank you to Sustainability Commissioner Friedman for the detail, the time he spent reviewing this, and the detailed look and the comments he provided us. Very much so. And he's on the he's on the call. So I see I see him there. Is he there? Yeah. <laughs> That's have... dedication. Are we? What page are we on now, Chair? Uh, we were on one sixty two. Mm -hmm. On one sixty three, I want to thank staff or acknowledge both staff and the consultants. The the language um, with which we own up to our past is i think appropriate and uh much appreciated and good job okay page 164 uh what I would say on fair housing is that this feels like it needs to be more thought through. It's um, it's soft. Yeah, we uh, potential options for um, expanding this this area. It needs expansion. 
And my question was, can it be more directive specific to an area of town, specific to the north end of town and the neighborhoods up there? That's uh, was my concern. It should be. I agree with, the ch with our chair. I think what this is crying out for is an action plan. You know, this feels more like a poem rather than a direction. I don't, I'd have to be convinced that you'd want to direct these goals to a particular part of the city. When I, Commissioner Hirschbein, let me respond to that. I've, I've walked Desert Highlands and there's glass on the street. Kids couldn't ride a bike. Well, I'm not disputing no, 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 that there's- I'm just saying that the condition of that neighborhood does need to be called out. It's been ignored. I mean, I, I'm not disputing that, but if you have a list of fair housing goals, why would you not apply that to the whole city? You should. You would, but I think I agree with you, but I think that what we should do, that's a whole separate document where we maybe grade neighborhoods and then have an action plan based on need, handle it much the way we handle street paving. Don't disagree with that at or all. Better. Just looking, or better I, than that. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with that. I'm looking at a list of, house, of fair housing goals, and I don't think you should pinpoint a neighborhood uh, I agree with you. for those. Fair housing uh, is le least implemented in your wealthiest neighborhoods. So they should be pinpointed then. Right, but in terms of... Uh, of improving neighborhoods, it should be dealt with the way we deal with streets. Well, this isn't this isn't neighborhood improvement goals. This is fair housing goals. I agree with you. Fair housing should be citywide, but it's very soft. So. Yeah. I I have something on one sixty five. Can we move on to that? Yes. Just a couple things. The first bullet point under actions on one point one. It says provide at the front counter. It should be or via the internet as well. And on that page, I have a question uh, for staff. As it is now, let's see, if we're looking at the bullet points and the actions, um, we're talking about having sufficient residential uh, sites for arena. As it is now, if somebody comes in and requests a general plan amendment that is going to change residential land to some other use, are they not required to produce in another location um, to convert land in another location so that you have the same yield of residential units? That is? Yes, yes, and perhaps our city attorney can speak to that, but there is state law that requires no net loss of housing. Okay, that's. I just wanted to make sure that it was codified or whatever. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a also on 165, the first bullet point under 1.2, uh, I would uh, continue to process minor modifications at staff level. I think should be inserted in there. I, I think, yeah, I would say continue to process administrative, minor modifications administratively. And zone changes can't be done through staff only, right? No. No, you're right, you're right, sorry. Well, where we can do it at staff level, I think we should encourage that. And Madam Chair, I just wanted to mention, uh, going back a few pages uh, from the comments that we had and discussion on 
page 162, um, Sustainability Commissioner Friedman did have some specific suggestions on HS 4.3. Uh, he suggested that we should also mention incorporating climate change mitigation in the construction, rehabilitation, and renovation of housing, as well as another comment on HS 4.7. I think we should adopt those. Is the word incorporate, is that what he suggested? It says uh, the policy should also mention incorporating climate change mitigation. Mention incorporating. Well, incorporate would be the way to start the sentence, I suppose. Okay, financial incentive. Are we on? Um, page 166. Sure. Oh, it looks like I, I see your notes. I think I was asking the same question you were, were talking about the promote financial and development assistance. What does that look like? Is, is that marketing uh, materials? Is that, I mean, what are you providing to the community on an annual basis? Maybe we should take out the word an annual basis there. I think this is really intended uh, to perhaps address the comments that came from um, Mr. Crawford earlier in the meeting in terms of creating pathways to ownership and looking at programs that assist in doing that. I think it's part of a larger uh, effort by the city uh, to uh, house residents and to open up opportunities for ownership. Uh, and so that's what I think it's really intended to address. So perhaps it's not on an annual basis, Mm -hmm. uh, that may be just limited to the CDBG funds that come available to us, but I think it needs to be broader than that. The, providing, uh, providing educational programs for first-time home, home buyers. So, yes. Uh, he mentioned various programs, most of which uh, are their self-help housing programs that are directed that get financial incentives because people are farm workers. Uh, and uh, Palm Springs has been excluded from that recently. Uh, but I don't know if the definition of farm workers extends to people who work in the cannabis industry. But some of those uh, trying to get self-help housing programs in and working with regulators to get them um, approved for this jurisdiction would be important, but it's been hard to do. And so I think it's going a little bit toward that, isn't it, Flynn? Yes, I believe so. I, I believe we also had wording in the last uh, housing uh, plan with uh, specific wording um, that, that was uh, not placed on this uh, new general plan from uh, the last general plan. Regarding self-help housing? Yeah, in regards to self-help housing. We should look at that and it may be negotiations with, uh, with providers that provide subsidies. That's, uh, I know that recently, um, when Coachella Valley was developing self-help housing, it couldn't be done in Palm Springs in the last couple of years. But we should at least negotiate, investigate, promote. Okay, going right along to page 167, and this is the ADU program. So 
Um, I know that Commissioner Hirschbein had some suggestions and I think I have a couple too on ADUs. Commissioner Hirschbein, the floor is yours on this. Well, just one is as it, as it pertains specifically to ADUs, and that is, again, it's not my idea. It's something I read about and circulated some articles to staff. Uh, certain municipalities allow a builder to come in with a, a standardized set of construction documents, get a pre-plan checked, and then if they can sell that house or that ADU to a homeowner, they go in with that plan and it gets stamped over the counter rather than taking it behind the counter, which as architects in the city know, can be a many weeks uh, process. It would eliminate weeks and weeks off of the process. So I don't know, again, if that's a, a uh, appropriate for the general plan, but it, it, I think it deserves some uh, oxygen to see if we can do that to encourage ADU construction. Mr. Hirschbein, I, I think under the middle bullet point there in terms of incentives, uh, that would certainly be an incentive to pre-approve plans for ADU construction. Um, and just so you're aware, we met with a modular home builder last week to discuss pre-approving some of their models that would be appropriate for Palm Springs uh, by taking them through architectural review as a group and then making them available to consumers from the pre-approved plans that they have available or the pre-approved models that they have available. So we certainly support that. And I think by adding language relative to incentives uh, would be helpful so that we continue to look at things such as that, that would make uh, the construction of ADUs quicker and easier for property owners. Cheaper too. Cheaper. Um, and, and also uh, under small lot housing, um, I, I, I would again throw out there the notion that we can upzone certain R1 lots to allow duplexes and par perhaps fourplexes and to uh, where there's adequate on-street parking to uh, minimize uh, the requirement for on-street parking. Under going back to ADUs, I think we want to add in that education of HOAs that, AD, that you're required to allow ADUs because most HOAs don't want to or mm -hmm. they ignore the changes. Are they allowed to prohibit them under state law? Prohibit them under state law, but um, I'm sure they can discourage them. Right, right. And the other would be in new single family zones consider asking uh, two things of developers in their casitas to do a full unit so that there is cooking facilities as well as sleeping and bath. Uh, and the other was would be to show on their plans where an ADU could be created. On so, an R1 project. In an R1 project so that it could be sold with to require that of every every housing design that came in. I like that. So well, I, whoever brought up earlier allowing more density or more square footage or FAR um, as an incentive with new construction specifically, um, I don't know if this is the place to add that language. And I also want to add, ask staff if it benefits staff when they're taking in projects or working with applicants to go on a case by case basis to leave as much flexibility in this as possible to offer applicants the ability to come up with creative ideas of doing this and allow staff to be creative with them and suggesting. Um, and, and I don't know if that means anything or not, uh, Director Bag, uh, but I love your ideas on it. I, I will say that under state law, they do allow quite a degree of flexibility or creativity, if you want to, for ADUs, including reduced setbacks, uh, elimination of parking requirements, and things like that. 
Uh, so already we do have in place in our zoning code the language from state law relative to some of those things. But uh, I agree that anything that we can do to encourage the development of ADUs, since it's a critical component of meeting our regional housing numbers, is certainly important to include in the language of our general plan. So specifically, do you want language that allows for more flexibility or do you need it? Yeah, I, I think that we've got uh, adequate language there. Um, we've got some language about regulatory incentives, which really talks to creativity. Um, so I think we've already got it there. Okay. Anything more? Uh, we've mentioned the small lots. Um, page 168. Before I have a question there, but before we go that, do that, is there a, a, a place within this document to address some of the concerns that the trade unions have? For use of labor and you know, qualify, et cetera, the things that the trade unions raise? I don't know if it's a place so much for the general plan as rather policy that might be established by the city council. I see. Okay. Um, what exactly is an inclusionary housing ordinance? It. Lori, do you want to do that? Unless uh, Director Fagg wants to beat me to it, either way. Carry it, on, Mr. Land. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, ordinance that, that would implement a policy wherein market rate home builders need to include in their projects, a certain percentage of the units that will be sold and maintained at an affordable price. Uh, so if you're building homes and selling them for $650,000, you, uh, you have to include, typically it's about 15% of those uh, that have to be affordable to families or individuals um, based on their income, either low, uh, very low or moderate income. So you, what you're doing is requiring that a developer um, to sell 85% of his homes at a higher price so that he can uh, sell the remaining 15% at a lower price. And those would be deed restricted, the lower uh, price? Yes. And the, Could they be uh, rental housing? Uh, it happens in rental and in for sale products. And I will tell you that the city council um, apparently asked the planning department to take a look at potentially putting together, not necessarily an ordinance, but a program or policy about uh, inclusionary housing. And there's a subcommittee that's working on that. And uh, Flynn is taking the lead on that and he's got us marching um, through a, a, a really good, I think, analysis, a really good data gathering exercise to give the council by the first meeting in September um, an education as to what is available, what might work, what might not work. And is, is it all requirements or are there incentives also? Or is there what? Incentives. Requirements. These are requirements. And, and I've seen it uh, include in lieu fees instead of units. I've seen it include off-site building off-site apartments instead of building them on-site. Or land that can be used. That could be used as, if I, I live down the street from one that was built uh, as a complement to a very, very luxury um, building that was condos. Uh, so it's got, uh, it could even include requirements for a percentage of ADUs in a single, in, I mean, there are an, a range of things that you could include. Um, often they have requirements that uh, sometimes they're allowed to be lesser than the, the other units, and sometimes they're required to be as good as the other units that are built. There's a lot of range and cities have done different things. Yeah. The, 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 the theory is of course that for every market rate unit that you build, you bring people to town to live in those units and they 
need services from service workers, whether it's cashiers or gardeners or landscapers uh, or swimming pool uh, cleaners. And you need to have, uh, so it's the uh, burden of everybody who can afford market rate to help provide for uh, decent, safe and sanitary housing for people who work for them and are necessary for them uh, but don't have the financial uh, resources available to live in the community otherwise. Is is there any way, um, in any of the wording, that uh, we could um, have it to where they can't have vacation rentals or it can be a vacation rental if they are um, required to, to build those type of homes? Can we make sure they're not for vacation rentals somewhat? wording wise and in, in the, the wording of it? We've, the answer is yes, we've done that. And not allowed vacation rentals in ADUs. We've not allowed them in some of our uh, small lot communities and planned unit development. So I'm sure you can, you, I mean, that would, you can require that people live in the house for a certain number of years that if it's resold, it's resold to somebody at an affordable rate. There are a lot of conditions you could put in. Um, you know, when we wrote the vacation rental policy, we eliminated all apartments. You know, we cut big swaths. We left HOAs on their own because they were generally as strict or stricter than the city could be on on new ideas, um, I, it would seem to me if a homeowner were to benefit from an incentive to build an ADU, meaning increased density or, or uh, you know, reduce setbacks or all the things that Director Fag mentioned, it would be an easy takeaway to just say, if you take these incentives, you can't have door number one and door number two, then you give up your right for vacation rentals in perpetuity. So the answer is yes, it would probably be pretty easy to write in, um, but you know, we're now going into a whole nother department you know, to do that. I agree with that notion, though. You're, we're doing all this stuff to increase housing, and we don't want that to slip through the cracks. I agree with you because many people, I think it's a really good call on your part because many people will just see that as an opportunity right. to make money. Yeah, and to be able, you know, and as, as the chair pointed out, now we're adding kitchens, we're making it a separate home that could be fully rentable. And currently with vacation rentals, we completely allow casitas and encourage their use, um, generally because the homeowner is there as well. So, uh, yeah, that would be a big shift and change based on this use of policy. Uh, moving right along. I have a couple of comments on page 169. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to even ask about the status of the design standards, so I'm assuming that's another discussion. But of course, we're keeping track of progress on that, and hopefully it's moving along. Um, under H2, HS 2.2, under actions, I would just add and encourage Mills Act property tax reduction designations. Because I don't think a lot of people necessarily know what Mills Act is. And it's a property tax re tax reduction. So I would suggest. I agree. I like that. The bullet below that. Continue to update the historic. Re well, the um, the guideline really is every five years. That's what's recommended for updating historic resource surveys. So I think the goal should be to update. Uh, continue to update the historic resources survey uh, every five years. And I could uh, you could probably add per the requirements of the state office of historic preservation or something like that. I'd like to stay on 169 for a minute because it was a discussion we had when we were changing the, the process between uh, ARC, 
architectural review and planning. And that is, uh, we can adopt objective residential design standards, but we still got to understand that design is subjective and we need to allow ARC, ARC, architecture and us, the flexibility that allows us to identify something that falls within some specific guidelines, but just doesn't cut it as far as the design goes. So that would be in the development of those design guidelines where you would put those measures in place, Commissioner. Right, right. But you're saying adopt objective residential development and design standards. I think there has to be also a statement in there recognizing that there, there's, there's wiggle room in there for us to apply our design uh, in, uh, input. Okay. To the degree that state law allows, there are certain provisions in state law relative to residential design standards, uh, which does limit the ability of local jurisdictions. Uh, but again, that's something that we can look at in the implementation phase of that. Right. I mean, it, it, when we were discussing it before, it had to do with certain findings that needed to be made. I, I do have a comment too on the um, at the bottom of this page on historic preservation, and I understand as I say this uh, that I might be walking into a buzzsaw. Nonetheless, I'll throw it out there. The second bullet point talks about continuing to update historic preservation survey and adding new structures, class one or class two historic. Um, I know that the, there's a tension there between two interests. If we are trying to get um affordable housing and affordable um, apartments out there there are structures around town that are probably suitable for being used for affordable housing registering them as class one or class two historic is probably going to make that uh renovation and reuse as apartments um cost prohibitive. It's gonna make it more expensive. It's gonna make it more difficult and take longer. So my question for the group in general is, what are we doing here? Are we trying to facilitate um, cost-effective housing and reuse of some of the structures that have been around there for a long time and that are uh, unused or unutilized? Are, are we more interested in preserving the historic significance of them and having them restored for historic purposes, or are we more interested in um, transitioning them into housing that is uh, likely rental housing that adds to our portfolio of properties that it's are- It's not really an either or. I mean, we this town is big enough to be able to handle um, you know, solutions for affordable housing as well as identifying properties that are worthy of designation or recognition. And that is what the, you know, the, the Historic Site Preservation Board is one of their goals is to identify properties that could possibly be designated as class one and class two, and they have to go through the whole process. It's, I think it's an important, um, for this city, I think it's very important to call out um, our emphasis on and, and, and belief in historic resources, specifically um, residential or well, buildings in general. So I don't think this- um, and, is, and is the housing element of the general plan the place to plant that flag? Why not? I mean, it's housing we're talking about. Well, the two aren't mutually exclusive. Right. And designation doesn't mean you can't change the use, right? right? So designation is about preserving the character and the architecture of a building. It doesn't really speak to how you use it. So in, I think your points, Commissioner O'Neill, are really strong. I mean, but I think, um, I think we're pretty safe here. Again, it would be a case-by-case -case basis. The, right. I think the real question, again, comes back to educating developers and others that you can do that, that 
you know, people are terrified, especially developers and investors are terrified to get near, anywhere near a designated building because they think their hands will be tied or, I love your term, they're walking into a buzzsaw. <laughs> but the reality is a good adaptive reuse of a historic building is just a great idea because what I see over and over again is a lot of these designated buildings are suffering because their their use doesn't work anymore. And I could name lots of buildings downtown like that. So the two aren't mutually exclusive. Um, but I just, I, 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 agree, I agree that they are not. I also believe that it is more expensive to renovate con and more time consuming to renovate uh, consistent with a historic designation than without that in place. And that it will uh, deter investment in those properties Unless we for, by, by, pe by people who would use it for affordable housing. I think it's more of a fear in theory. And yeah. again, I think we can sprinkle it with incentives and um, make it worth their while. It seems to me it's going to, it's going to be the last, I agree with you, it's going to be the last thing that's probably going to happen because of people's fears. But that's too bad because it doesn't have to be. Uh, Commissioner Roberts, you might have just hit upon the magic word there that would help this, help me with this. If we could somehow talk about or uh, investigate uh, incentives for converting some of these, for, for preserving them as class one or class two and converting them to affordable housing. There's some great opportunities there. Or, or, yeah, if, if we could uh, look for a way to marry the two. But that's all I have to say. I mean, the, the whole point about that talks about Mozak property tax reductions. There's, you know, there's um, tax credits that are available from the state and from the federal government for rehabilitation. There's all sorts of incentives. I mean, you could go on a pretty detailed list, but you could then, or you could somehow word in there, um, you know, and, and prioritize um, you know, the use of incentives such as tax credits and other, you know, forms of, in, of incentives to motivate, you know, this is a good way to word that, I think, without removing it. What do you think, Director Fack? How do we, how do we put that some language there? More importantly, again, this is one more thing we should take up. I may be the only person here who's renovated a historic building for affordable housing. Yeah, I, I think it makes you a superhero. <laughs> it was much more, it was more expensive, but it was mainly working with people who cared more about window millions than saving the building. Um, I might suggest, I think, looking at what you suggested is perhaps um, looking at incentives for adaptive reuse of historic structures for housing purposes or something along those lines. Does that capture uh, yeah. what we're looking at doing? Yeah, it can be, it can be done. It was done with lots of public financing, uh, but it's, I think if we can negotiate, we can also negotiate with some of, on some of the is issues that are exceedingly expensive. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, I had a question on HS 1.7 hotel conversion. It'll be a real quick one. Um, it's. Thank you. It has to do about uh, the second bullet point, consider current regulation for hotel conversion, and if needed, revise accordingly to facilitate conversions of hotels to apartments. Is that, um, Director Fag, is that on that definition of what is considered a kitchen for a dwelling unit? And in this case, could the, could the definition be more lenient? I don't know if it's really the definition of a kitchen that is the issue in the conversion. Um, sometimes it's the density of existing hotels in terms of uh, once they convert to residential units, they exceed density. 
It could be parking requirements. It could be any number of things. Um, but kitchens, at least in what we've seen uh, over the last number of years, hasn't been the issue as much as other development standards. Um, I think it was if 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 we could be expansive on the uh, on the definition of so so European kitchens or not European but kitchenettes in which for a single SRO it's more than sufficient uh, and could could that be a more sort of open-minded way of converting hotels into apartments for more immediate you know professionals or or again seniors or um, um, that they're not low income, you know, that um, they they just need a small place to, you know, for them to reside in Palm Springs. What we might look at doing is um, making sure we have language about SROs and uh, making sure that we follow through in terms of developing language in the zoning code as well. And in the zoning code, we can get into the specifics of types of kitchens. Uh, so that's a good point. Thank you. And we'll look at how we might be able to incorporate that. I have a question, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, will there be time tonight for us to address the letters that we've received from a number of interested parties regarding yes. land use? Yes, we're going, we're, I want to finish this uh, and we're pretty, we're pretty close to the end. And then we'll go into that. We have um, we have letters that we've received. Uh, we do have to deal with the land use plan. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's maybe if I can get us to try and speed through the rest of this. Um, housing rehabilitation programs, page one seventy. I would just like it to include um, people's trailers in trailer parks that they own, that they, that we would, we would, if we can, we can apply it to improving their, their, uh, the home they own. I agree. Yes. Um, I think they've dealt well with preserving at work housing. I don't think we need to make any changes in that. Neighborhood services that. I, I kind of wonder why HS 2.7 is in there at all, but that's, that might be just me. I had a, I had a point under neighborhood safety. I'd like to have a sentence about improving pedestrian and bicycle connectivity and require new developments to allow for connectivity. I think we've seen a lot of developments lately that don't do that, that have very large blocks of land that are impenetrable, impenetrable by the public. Commissioner well, Furtwein, could you state that first part again? I don't know. <laughs> Improve I heard activity. Improve, it's getting late. Improve pedestrian and bicycle connectivity and require new developments to allow for more con connectivity. On the same, on uh, neighborhood safety, and this goes to, I think, some of the concerns we have from people at the north end of town, and there was a mention about uh, high crime rates. Um, staff, do we have a crime-free multi-housing program in the city? Are you familiar with that type of program? Sorry. What was it? A crime-free multi-housing program where you get the managers from all your apartment buildings to get together and they work with the police to identify ways that they can uh, minimize or reduce crime in their own uh, apartment complexes? I'm not sure if we do. We might, and I just don't know about it, but um, you know, our, our police officers do regularly work with the neighborhood organizations. Uh, so I know they- Except kind of things? 
This is specifically for multifamily, and they're very effective um, at helping to reduce crime in multifamily developments and apartments. Um, I, and I was just going to say, suggest that that could be one of the implementation things is to investigate uh, adoption of or implementation of a uh, crime-free multi-housing program for for the city. It costs just nothing, uh, you know, it costs uh, 40 hours of staff time a year to get going and it does produce good results. Let's add it. Uh, I was curious as well to um, go back to the neighborhood services and uh, hear what, what you um, were uh, saying, Chair, about uh, the reason why you think it shouldn't be in there. Well, the neighborhood, I mean, the it, partially um, maybe improving our neighborhood organizations, often they get reduced to a few people who serve and serve again and they don't really reach out to neighborhoods. Uh, so it was just, uh, and, and in the past they had created themselves in such ways that they eliminated the apartment buildings in their neighborhoods. Uh, so uh, I guess it would be make, making sure that they're more inclusive of um, affordable units and rentals I, I, and it was more um, that I would like them to be more inclusive of um, housing in addition to single family housing. I would definitely agree with that as well. And um, also some of the, uh, once again, we're going back to the mobile homes as well. Um, mm -hmm. the, those, those communities well need to be included into the neighborhood organizations as well. Yeah. So maybe we include we include that language. And 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 I believe they uh, th those mobile homes uh, tend to not have a place to uh, form or gather. So maybe if some of those neighborhood organizations could help them to to form it, I mean to have a place where they can form and gather as well. And I know that actually mobile home parks typically do have a community clubhouse kind of place. Uh, I used to have a place in Sahara Park and there was a nice clubhouse there. And it might be nice to require the neighborhood organizations to meet there. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think as well too, Coyote Runs as well has um, some, some meeting area as well, but community I think rooms. we just have to in include them and to the neighborhood organizations. Yep. It's also a very nice place to meet, having done that. Um, rental assistance, I guess. Uh, do we have comments on rental assistance, HS 3.1? Seeing none, I'm going to move along. Um, I'm sorry, is it just is a voucher accepted on a voluntary basis by the landlord law? Section eight. So that it's always a voluntary basis? Yes. Okay. On, on page 175, 3.4, uh, sort of half foot. In the middle of that paragraph, new qualified multiple multiple family housing. I mean, that's stating the obvious. I mean, it, it obviously has to comply. I don't. It's just redundant to me. Sorry, what number are we on? Three point four on page one seventy five, the top first paragraph. Halfway down the middle of the paragraph, new qualified multiple family housing projects must fully comply. I mean, you could say that about any law. No, I think they're referencing to uh, to 
maybe a home that's been renovated to have multiple units to, uh, uh, um, and therefore they, sh they should be upgraded to be uh, accessible. So maybe multifamily is not the right word. Well, I, I just mean there's policies in place and there's laws in place that address all that. And I don't know that you need to. Anyway, it's no big deal. If you want to leave it in there, that's fine. It just seemed redundant to me. And on the facing page, uh, HS 3.2, and this actually comes up in 3.2, 3.3, 3.7. There are a couple of places where um, we're naming names of organizations like Lift to Rise, work, work with a particular uh, provider of services. Probably we should just say uh, qualified nonprofit because you don't want to commit to a particular agency or another in the general plan. Um, and I also note that Desert Age Project has a new name and that's not reflected in a number of places through here. And it could change over years too. Yes, yeah, so if you keep it generic, um, you're good. I think their new name is DAP Health. Yes, I believe that's correct. I, I have a question about sober living facilities. Is that a category the city recognizes? Yes. Oh, sorry, I won't answer. And if it is, should we be, uh, sh should we encourage, should that be a bullet point? Should we encourage those? I'm looking at uh, HS 3.5 residential care facilities. I know it's not that, but I'm just saying it might be a category that we would want to uh, support. We typically categorize that as transitional or supportive housing. Um, and under state law, we are required to adhere to the requirements that they have. Uh, what we might do is just make sure that we have a reference to that somewhere in the housing element as it is uh, a vital okay. housing resource. Okay, yeah, thank you. We, we address that in the next uh, program, 3.6. It says silver living. Does it say transitional housing? Transitional housing and permanent supportive housing. Under the third bullet point. Then this will to indicate the transition to permanent supportive. So is, is that a definition of silver living? It falls under that category, yes. Okay, thank you. And going back to the point about SROs, that's also addressed in that um, program. The navigation center is a non-defined thing. Um, and uh, I know it's being discussed, but it's basically un still undefined. Madam Chair, can you speak a little more loudly? Oh, I'm uh, na the navigation center in um, on page 176. The second bullet from the end, it's not it's not a defined what a navigation center is, is not defined any place. I don't know that it is, but we can make sure that we do. It's a term it's a term that's being used without a definition. OK, it's not, it's not a typical term um, and they're different different modalities of what that might be all the way from Father Joe's in San Diego to something that provides services and, uh, and day space. So I think we should, we should identify what that is. Okay. Kaylee, did you have a comment on this? I did actually, I was just looking at, it looks like it might be on page 73. So I would just suggest that, um, because it, it talks about it on the low barrier navigation center development. So 
it perhaps is identified, but earlier in the document. We'll just make sure we carry that through. <clears throat> Are we going to talk about hillside development at this point? We can. I had a number of bullet points, and I'll just read them quickly. And I don't know if they, again, I'm, 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 this is the first time I'm reviewing a general plan. I'm not sure if this applies or not, but I'll just read them and let staff guide me. Um, I, I was going to say, make more robust the protection of our undisturbed hillsides by, number one, limiting the amount of grading allowed, both in area and cubic amounts. <clears throat> Two, requiring dedication of undisturbed open space. Three, reducing the number of units per acre in these areas. Uh, and number four, reducing lot coverage. Um, number five, this, this came up when we were reviewing the Osprey Canyon development, prohibit large retention basins and other hillside modifications meant to channel or mitigate water flow, uh, increase minimum lot size, and prohibit ancillary uses. That'd be like hotels or golf courses. Commissioner Hirschbein, could you email those to us? Um, some of these may be appropriate in the land use element. Um, so let us take a look at where they may fit best. Okay. In terms of reducing density in hillside areas, we already have pretty strict density limits. Uh, and then again, we run into the issue, if we reduce residential density, we have to make it up somewhere else. Um, so we just need to be very cautious with that. But the other points I think we can look at um, and see where they might fit most appropriately. Okay, to the whole commission or to staff? I think to staff. Yeah, to staff is fine. Okay. And then I had something on water conservation. It mentions the Desert Water Agency has suspended mandatory conservation. But again, it's a 10-year document or 20-year document, 10-year document, I don't know. I don't think we should be referencing uh, what's mandatory now or was mandatory. We don't know what's going to be mandatory because the document's gonna last a long time. Provide some alternate language on exactly the same point and possibly we could use this language. I didn't, I didn't hear you. David Friedman provided alternate language. Oh, okay, okay, That's good. Same point, and okay. we could use this language. Okay. And then on residential energy conservation, I already made this point earlier, but this statement is just upholding the status quo uh, under 4.3. Uh, and it, we need to be more proactive about what we want to happen, not just saying we're okay with where we're at now. But I already mentioned that before. And and I had mentioned before that we should implement uh, what aspects in terms of limiting um, best practices to limiting usage and over usage in houses. Mm -hmm. any uh, we have a lot of language in here regarding the multi-species habitat conservation plan i don't know if we've had any comments on this language from some of the environmental groups i think it might be good to have that we'll go through the public input to verify 
Okay. And I know that we, um, and now we're at five year at fair housing. Again, I think this needs more work, but. Any other comments on this document? It's a very good draft overall. Very impressive compared to the previous one. It is very impressive there. And I don't know if we should change it. The references in most of the instances of prices starting uh, at 600,000 is probably from the year to uh, 2020 and not from 2021. Uh, pricing is higher than is mentioned currently in the document. And prices fluctuate. They yep. go down too sometimes. Yep. Although I I know at one point it mentioned the toll, the new Toll Brothers development in Asina will start at 600,000 and I think you have to add five to 600,000 to that number. Uh, but that's uh, that's just a comment. Um, and in the arena numbers, units aren't totaled up. I think you have overages, but it would be nice to see totals as well. Yes. Madam Chair, might I suggest we've gone through the document. We've still got a number of things to look at in terms of some of the public comment. Would it be helpful to take just a short break and then come back and uh, finalize? Yeah. Should we discussion? take a 10 minute break? Okay. Yes. It's 8.30 right now, so come back at 8.40. Okay, terrific, thank you. Recording stop.
we can continue. We have two more items in front, uh, actually three more. The land use plan and build out and responding to the requests from members of the public for changes to the land use plan. Um, would we like to take up the request for changes to the land use plan first or should we go through it? No, I, I would prefer to go through the responding to the public. I think they, they would appreciate it. I think they would too. We have, we have three requests. We've answered one of those. <clears throat> With the request from Desert Highlands. Um, and we had a few more requests came in through comments on the land use plan. So why don't we first take up the question of the rezoning of the um, desert, the desert area, the rezoning of 95 acres. Of Ooh. Madam Chair, may I ask a question of our attorney? Mm -hmm. um, changing a land use designation from something that is residential to open space park, is that considered a taking? It's not a taking it. There's potentially, I mean, cause there is uses that are allowed. What property are we specifically talking well, about and what's the current use allowed? A number of our letters and are suggesting that we, you know, change land use designations to open space park. And which is sounds fine, but I don't know if we can actually suggest that. And that's why I didn't know if it's something, for instance, Palm Hills. You know, I would say, why don't we change that? Let's sit to Open Space Park. And is that something we can suggest, or is it an issue relating to, you know, the taking? It, I believe the suggestion was made by Joan Taylor, and she was talking about changing the land use designation in areas that have been purchased with public money and are now now formally open space. So there was, I think, 32, am I correct, 32 acres in Palm Hills. And I believe she also mentioned Shadow Rock, Shadow Rock which is now, uh, now public, it was purchased with public money. So we have a number of areas like that in the city that have gone through a conversion and deed restriction process, but I don't believe the zoning has formally changed. The land use designation, you mean? Right. So okay. that's that the director is uh, changing the designations for, pro for projects or land that has been purchased for conservation purposes. I've asked Ms. Taylor to follow up with us just to make sure that we have the correct parcels and uh, make those changes appropriately. So we will go ahead and do that. I believe so I'm I too soft, Mr. Maruzzi. <laughs> I'll scoot closer. <laughs> we'll verify those parcels with uh, Ms. Taylor and make sure that we have the appropriate designations for them. I believe that probably. Uh... Nikki McLaughlin also has some parcels, 11 acres near Oswet. Um, I'm not sure if all of the parcels that were purchased on the cone were transferred to the city, but I think there's a no there are a number of parcels and I don't know if Oswet is, is now permanent and the land use designation should change on it. I mean, you know, several of the suggestions were that boulders and crescendo should be a land use designation of open space park. It's not owned by, it's privately owned. Well, the city owns it. So it's um, city owned land. I mean, can we do that? Can we suggest sure. that? 
Okay. Yeah, you've also had suggestions that they be used for multifamily housing as well. Correct. What I'd recommend is that you forward to the city council consideration of redesignation of the boulders and crescendo sites. I believe those two sites in particular are going to require additional conversation. Um, we also have to look at the loss of housing units on those sites uh, and make sure that we accommodate appropriately. But that's why I asked if they were in the arena numbers, and apparently they're not included in the arena numbers, those two, two parcels. That's so correct. We, we wouldn't have to accommodate for them, would we? Right. But the, the, the state law is that whatever residential you had established in 2018 has to still be, uh, you still have to accommodate that same number of units moving forward. Same number of units? Same number Please. of res Sorry, Ms. Odo. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dave. There, there needs to be no net loss. So it needs to accommodate the same number of units. So to the extent that the city has upzoned or increased density in some area, you could use that to accommodate and basically make up for the loss in another location. But um, Mr. Newell is correct. There has to be no net loss under state law. It has nothing to do with your arena numbers per se. It has to do with just what's been zoned residential in 2018. Hmm. Okay, that's a complication I wasn't aware of. Thanks. Well, clearly we're up zoning a lot of areas, so I don't think it's going to factor into it. I hope you're right. Uh, I'm there. We're, I'm sure we're all tired. I think the first thing that was before us was changing the land use designations for parcels that have been purchased or deed restricted for conservation purposes, and I'm assuming that we all agree with that. Uh, so we, we'd like to add that. Uh, boulders and Crescendo, I'd like to take that later and deal first with the parts that were on our agenda. One is the um, applicant, the owner's request to rezone 95, um, help me with this, 95 units that are currently um, Zoned desert to regional commercial. Uh, is there a response to that from this group? <laughs> I wouldn't support it. We had a big no, discussion about this. Or do I? I do not. I would not be in favor of it. Commissioner Irvin. Can, can you can you repeat the? Um... It's ninety. It's the. It was. It's ninety five acres that are currently um, zoned desert, and I think desert allows one house per ten acres. Am I correct, Mr. Newell? Yes. And they've been asking to have that zoned regional commercial and what they want to do is put I think 1400 trucks on that space no. uh, yeah no. I, and I, no. it, I just want to say that when this came up we had one of the water agencies come in and ask us to never do this because it would interfere with our aquifer uh, so I'm I'm not in favor of it do we have to provide any explanation for response here, or can we just do it this way? Do we have any formal explanations? I think let's try formal explanations. Uh, removing a uh, removing an open space designation that we're not in favor of doing that. That it's not a good land use. It's not a good use for that particular land, and that it's environmentally sensitive, and that it might have implications for our aquifer. Yes. Yeah, I suggest that it sets a bad precedent for land use in this area. And I, I think one of the things that characterizes this request and one of the others, as opposed to the ones from the uh, gateway community we heard from earlier, is the, the earlier one had broad community support. They've gotten together as a community, looked at the future of their community and the way it was going to develop, and they came to us with a request. This, this request before us represents the interests of a particular landholder. 
who has a strong financial incentive for requesting it. It's a different type of request. Very true. And, and, and one that, as a commission, I don't believe we are um, appointed to represent the interests of a single landowner. We're here to represent the interests of the community. And this, I'm sorry. This is not in the interest of the community, this change. No. And if you wanted to be more specific about the environmental aspects of it, there's some good language, I think, in some of the letters, of maybe from Hosworth Lands Trust, in terms of its importance for for um, animals to traverse it uh, the, without having a blockage in between. I, exa I don't exactly know what the wording is, but that's a very good reason, important reason for me. Habitat preservation. Habit habitat preservation in the middle of an area that already is protected. And it's in between two conservation areas. That's what I meant, exactly. Uh, is that sufficient? Do we need yeah. a recall vote? No. Okay. No, uh, your, your formal action will take place after you hold the public hearing uh, when we adopt the language plan. The second, the second is the uh, the change in Bel Air Greens uh, from open space parks and recre recreation to low density residential, and I think we've we have dealt with this and had large community meetings regarding um, the use, the potential of turning this into housing and hotels with a community uproar against it. Um, does anybody want, is anybody in support of this change? Is anyone opposed? I'm opposed. I'm opposed to the opposed. change. Opposed. I'm. I'm a little. I'm a little bit unclear on why we're doing this right now. In other words, we could get a million different requests um, for land use changes, and they could be based on every special interest on on the planet. It seems odd to me that we're walking through and voting on every simple request. I don't think this is necessary here. In other words, we can leave things as they are. We don't need to go back and re-vote on everything. So in other words, the Planning Commission already dealt with this issue. Simply because there's a request from some person doesn't make it, I think, worthy of even really discussing unless we're in a ma major hearing on this issue for a reason. It, for, for what staff is requesting from us, forgive me, I might just be missing something here, but I don't understand this process. Staff, would staff like to speak to this? Yes, absolutely. You've received public comment relative to the designation of parcels. Uh, some of these are in the form of letters. Some of them are on the map that we unveiled at last week's community forum. You as the Planning Commission are determining whether they should be included as part of this general plan update. Uh, some of them you have included and others you may not because as uh, Commissioner Alain indicated earlier, there isn't either community interest or support, nor does it benefit the general public. And so for various reasons, you may not consider some of the requests that are made to you. Um, because there has been specific discussion about these two parcels, it's helpful to get your direction uh, that you are not considering them at this time. Uh, you will also discuss, I believe, crescendo and boulders. It may be helpful for City Council to have some direction from the Planning Commission on those two parcels, as there has been community comment on them as well. But again, you do not need to consider each and every one uh, only those that you feel are in the interest of the community. Well, then do we not have a duty to address every single request? You may, and again, you have sufficient public comment. See, that's what I don't understand. We're, we're, we're handpicking a few of these, and it, it, it just doesn't, it seems like a really odd process to me. 
I mean, I, I could be the only one feeling that way, but I, I guess if we're going to do it, we'll do it. I just, it feels odd to me. Yeah. You have a lot of public comment and you can bring up the public comment that you feel is relevant to this discussion as the next hour progresses. Um, I think it would be better given the amount of public comment to address this and say that I don't think this should be included in land use update at this time. I'll go for that as well. And I guess we're all, in this, we're all together on that. Indeed. Uh, Commissioner Maruzzi, were you making comment? To your no, I just said I agree with that. Ah, and and I think the reasons are similar. I don't think there was community opposition to this in the past. There still is community opposition to it. Um, the only odd it, thing about it is that one little piece that's medium density residential, but we don't want to change that right now. But that's just an oddball element in Bel Air Gardens, which the which the previous map showed. But anyway, I don't think we can address that. It, it does have its peculiarities, yes. Uh, we had some other comments and maybe ask David if we could go through them, if he would like to go through any of them. Most of them appeared administrative. Relative to these several parcels or other comments on that? Yeah. On the map, there were comments that were placed on the map that people had a chance to make comments on uh, before the 18th. Correct, yeah. So uh, there was about a total of seven comments that we received um, from the online mapping activity that we conducted as a part of the public workshop. Um, I can share those with you now, uh, but there's really uh, three kind of focal areas um, rel relative to those comments. So let me share the, the map with you. So the first comment was uh, I'll zoom in here is uh, relative to the animal shelter site. Uh, so the plan, uh, or at least what we were proposing for this site, is to redesignate it from the current open space parks recreation designation um, to the public quasi public, and uh, there are some comments about the designation and whether it was appropriate for the shelter, um, suggesting that the, sh the rear portion of it should remain open space. Um, so I think the, the intent here with what we were trying to achieve with the proposed uh, revision is that the area um, that we're, that you know, this parcel occupies is primarily uh, developed with community serving uses. Uh, for instance, the animal shelter is located on the parcel. Uh, there's an AVOP center on the parcel. And for the most part, the remainder of the parcel is solar panels. Um, so it's really not an open space parks recreation use. Um, it is really more of a community serving use. Uh, I think the animal shelter's concerns were that the, there's open areas in the back that they use to walk pets, um, and that's that's fine. That the, the proposed change wouldn't impact that. Uh, actually, in the event that they chose to expand down the line, the public quasi public designation probably is more applicable and more appropriate for uh, such an expansion versus having it as open space parks recreation, which is really meant to keep it as open. So that's really the, the intention there with that one. It's my understanding that um, since that comment was attached, um, there's been some discussion with the shelter from I think the city explaining it to them. And I think they're okay with the this suggestion that's on the land use map. Am I correct? 
Let's see, I had conversations with Council Member Garner, and I think she forwarded those on to the animal shelter. And it's my understanding that they're happy, or they're, they're okay with it, but I, I don't want to speak for them. The other cluster that we have is three properties um, behind or near the end of Talkwitz Canyon Way uh, to designate the O'Donnell House from its current designation, Open Space Mountain, to Central Business District uh, to, to align with the operation of that, that, uh, that property as well as change the designation from estate residential for the Bishop House to Torch Resort Commercial to align with that use. And then a request to change Colony 29 property at Topwoods Drive um, from medium density to high density. Why would we wanna do this? Um, it's well, it was a request of a uh, member of the public. So there's no, there's no request that the commission deem this as appropriate. It's just, this was one of the comments we received. I, I don't understand what the motivation is though. Is it, is there something that they're not doing now on those sites that they want to do? <clears throat> or does the current designation allow them to do everything that they're currently doing? and that they continue and then in the future want to do as well. I believe those sites have changed hands recently. Right, I, I know, uh, uh, sorry, I can't remember her name. Tracy sold those, I know that. But I'm just asking, is there, <laughs> is there are they contemplating uses that the current designation wouldn't allow? And did the request come from the new property owner? I believe they're yeah, I know. from the new owner. So I think the issue is the, the current uses uh, have already established, uh, were already previously established through the plan development process. So the uses that they're operating in now um, are, you know, the, they have been established through the PD ordinance. Um, you don't typically see a transient or a assembly area within these types of designations for these two. Um, it's not uncommon to have a uh, hotel or um, um, short-term rental within an MDR designation. So the current uses, I don't. I would say um, some might align, some might not. But um, again, these were already established through the zoning code and the PD process. Can we just refer this to staff and let you evaluate this? That might be appropriate, Madam Chair. I think that would uh, be very Yeah, I don't want to start allowing uses that we don't know about. I mean, that just seems like there's a process for that. So right. for now, we'll leave this one uh, as it is, and then we'll evaluate that further at right. some point in the future. Uh, and then the third uh, kind of our last comment here on the map was someone had requested to see mixed use zoning along the Cicino with more walkable centers of commerce apart from downtown. Um, it's kind of located in an area that's already a, a developed established residential blocks. So um, it might be something that could be achieved in our mixed use designation in this location. That's where the Albertsons shopping center is located. Um, but you know that again, that that's something that we could look at through potentially as a, a zoning uh, change based on what the current designation is here for mixed use. Let's leave that to staff, and I would leave what you're doing with the animal shelter in the new designation. I think that's where we got to. Uh, do you want to go through the rest of the map? Is there anything that we need to look at that that you've changed? that we need to know about? Uh, I don't have anything else. I, we did get one comment from uh, the administrator of Smoke Tree. Uh, he knows one of the first letters that you have here relative to this designation uh, behind the Smoke Tree Commons. Um, 
when looking at the aerial, this boundary line, this natural boundary line is really the back boundary line of the shopping centers. So the comment was that this is extending into the conservation or the, the smoke treating areas. So that might be another one that they could, uh, that you might consider. And can we leave that to staff to resolve? Yes. Administratively. Are people in agreement with those? Is there any disagreement? Hearing none, let's move on. Uh, excuse me, I was a little slow on pushing, but I'm in agreement with um, a request that staff also take a look at their description of that last neighborhood smoke tree um, in the proposed language change or the red line copy that we have. It's talking about uh, how this is a intimate, small-scale, pedestrian-oriented zone when I see a bunch of big boxes, and I'm, I'm, I think it, I had to pull it up on the map and make sure we were talking about the same place because I think your description um, you misses kind of what's going on there. Okay, yeah, that, I, I see the, the point there where we, uh, I guess the question is, do we want that to do envision? I think since the general plan was adopted back in 2007, we have added the smoke commons. So you're right, it has kind of changed um, the experience of that area, uh, maybe not to the same extent that we have described it here. Um, but for the remaining parcels or potential any potential redevelopment within perhaps the smoke tree um, village area, do we think that that's appropriate uh, for the future of the kind of the general smoke tree, both village and commons? Because if we add if we add residential, which we describe later on, um, do we want to make sure it you know continues to have some sort of scale as it's described. I kind of like the juxtaposition. One is definitely a walking center and the other is <laughs> you go to Big Five, then you drive down to the uh, pet store at the other end. Um, it, it gives a little variety. David, you're asking to describe something now, but then you're also asking it to pertain to something in the future. So, I mean, we could have the goal of making it a more pedestrian friendly environment as the site becomes more densified, but to describe it that way, I think now is inaccurate. It's accurate for the old. Correct, correct. The Ralph site, but the Jensen site, not so much. Well, what we might do is just inter uh, introduce a sentence or two about how, um, you know, maintaining the intimate scale where it exists and accommodating, you know, just addressing that we also have some newer, uh, larger retailers within this mixed use area. Thank you. In, as part of the map, do you need to go through or do we need to go through the recommended revisions to the land use definitions? So I do have, we did, you know, we did touch on those last time. Uh, so we can certainly um, briefly go through those if you'd like, or if there's anything specific that the commission would like to uh, give direction on, we certainly can go over that. Just opening this up, does anybody, um, we have a lot of red lines here. Does anybody have comments going through pages? Through the attachment? I don't have any, but. No, I don't either. I thought it, they all made sense. I just yeah, I think one. Okay, go ahead. 
I just have one and it's on the, the last page where we're talking about the higher education campus. Um, and in particular, I note the percentages between the different types of uses there. I just wanted to verify, has COD uh, seen this, reviewed this, or they, do they believe it accurately reflects the ratio of school uses versus associated uses that we would anticipate there? That's a good question. And uh, we haven't actually, as far as I know, reviewed it with the um, administration yet. So uh, we certainly can do that. Uh, I'm, and I'm not sure the extent of which their model might be changing with COVID or, mm -hmm. or otherwise, but we can review that with the administration. That's probably, in particular, just what percentage is going to be office uh, or associated uses and what part or percentages um, educational. I don't have a keen enough eye to tell you if this is right or not, but they would. So with that change, are there any other comments? Um, Chair, um, I don't know, did I miss um, the the land use plan uh, request for Desert Highland? Um, was that, are we going to go past that or are we going to review it or? I thought we accepted that earlier. Oh, okay, I'm fine. I didn't raise it again because I thought we had agreed. Um, having done this, do we have to do anything on build out? Um, I have the numbers if we want to go through it again. Um, but again, I, the changes that obviously we, we've evaluated and looked at um, as a part of this, the, the housing element and the land use plan, um, they're not significant. Uh, so what we had in 2007 is, is it's changed a little bit, but it's not in a significant way. Uh, so if you look at the comparison of what we adopted in 2007 versus um, what we're proposing with the land use plan, uh, what it really does is um, just share this with you. It you know it demonstrates our commitment to increasing housing production um, and helps us achieve the housing element um, strategy that we need to achieve. Um, you'll, as you probably saw, there were, uh, we, we did change some of our land use descriptions to adjust and accommodate, um, to adjust and accommodate for, for you know, supporting housing um, where maybe it was more a barrier to get a housing project through. So we've eliminated the plan development process, district process, and where we could, and as you as you saw in the, uh, the descriptions. So um, when we get into the build out, what that means is slight increase in total housing units and households, uh, uh, as well as population with a minor reduction in non-residential square footage and jobs. So, um, with these, uh, with these, with this information, we are able to proceed with the environmental analysis that has to occur. Um, the changes we've discussed tonight, I don't expect would significantly change uh, these numbers, but um, but you know that again, we can finalize uh, the land use plan with uh, with the information we've gotten from you tonight, as well as what with what we direction we get from council tomorrow night. The College of the Desert changes may change the proposed um, number of units. Yeah, that could increase the number of units. Right. Um, the only thing that's difficult with this would be something that explains the difference between the six, and I mean, I know why we had the 63.3 an occupancy and the 95% occupancy. But I think it might be good to have some explanation here. Yes, please. Yeah, the, the, uh, 
a lot of second homeowners that don't claim Palm Springs as home. So that's where we see the, the stark difference between existing and what potential might be. Right. So, uh, but just an explanation. An asterisk and something that says that we have these homes, but. That, that makes sense. I, I, and I found language that I could follow about why we had the 65%. I couldn't track or understand how we came up to 95% this time. Do we really think that there are only 5% uh, of? Now, this is, so yeah, I think the intention is really just to say, you know, with our land uses, this would be our maximum capacity. Um, I don't expect we would ever get there um, because well, our occupancy rate is just much lower than other cities. We have a lot of second homeowners, so. Um, and the household sizes are, are going to be smaller in Palm Springs than, than other cities, so our population based on our average household size for Palm Springs uh, is much smaller. Um, right. And I just think a written explanation. So we will include that so it's clear. So we've dealt with almost everything in front of us. I think the only thing we haven't dealt with is boulders and Christino. Can I just ask? In the Oswald Land Trust letter, they mentioned the Canyon View development, but do we need to address that again? Because that was something that was just, you know, decided by the no. board is going to city no, council. That's an item for city council tomorrow yeah. night. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, um, I think she had it. Uh, it was either Nikki or Jane had an interesting idea about response, the city sponsoring some sort of uh, conference uh, with stakeholders on um, on these conservation efforts. It doesn't sound like a general plan item, but I, I would recommend that to council. And that's in the visioning plan, isn't it currently? Mr. Newell? Yeah, correct. So we still are continuing to refine the vision and priority statements. So. We expect we will have some outreach with the uh, preservation groups uh, as a part of that refinement. So we, we are recommend, we will recommend it and it's also part of the current plan. Um, Ms. Alanian, Commissioner Alanian, you had concerns about an economic analysis of the land use plan, do you still have those? I do. Would you like to raise that? Here's my concern. Um, we're changing, we're trying to achieve several different goals in general in the city. For instance, we would like to have uh, true mixed use downtown. We can write the general plan such that it allows um, mixed use downtown. What we don't know is whether or not that is a pipe dream and something we just want, or if there's any economic viability and it's likely to happen. If you do a fiscal impact analysis or a market condition analysis, you can determine whether or not it is financially viable for developers to build mixed use downtown if they go in knowing that the general plan allows it and they're not gonna to have to do an amendment um, and they know that it's allowed. They will then be able to look at the finances and pencil out and say, does it make sense or not? If we don't do the analysis ourselves, we have no idea whether or not it makes sense. And we don't know if we're just gonna be dreaming for the next five or 15 years that somebody will wanna put some residential components downtown or if we need to do something, if we need to tweak the general plan, um, if we need to allow increased density or height or something or other to change the conditions so that it will be financially viable and people will really go ahead and do it. So by not doing the market condition analysis, um, we are shorting ourselves from having knowledge as to whether or not this is likely to happen or 
if we are just having pipe dreams about something that has no financial viability and developers are not going to pursue. So uh, with that said, I, I would recommend and I would encourage, and this would have to be a city council decision because it would change your um, agreement with your with PlaceWorks uh, or it would bring in another consultant to do that kind of analysis to give us the knowledge of whether or not we're, what we're allowing through the general plan is likely to happen and to give us the opportunity to learn if it's not likely to happen, what do we need to do to change it to make it likely to happen? Uh, just one last thing. Unfortunately, if you don't have that knowledge uh, and you say, okay, we want it downtown, uh, but we want it village style where, you know, you can only be 26 feet tall or whatever it is, um, then developers will have to come to us and ask for us, the city, to participate financially to give them money to incentivize it because we've written the general plan uh, with constraints in it such that it won't be economically viable. So that's my two cents worth. Hasn't the market already spoken? Yes, the market is right now telling us or has been for some time that it doesn't make sense to do residential components downtown uh, well, with, well, with the constraints that we have. However, Michael Braun didn't think that. He's in and, a and do you see any residential components going up downtown? Well, I mean, isn't that what he, he he got approval for? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He had approval for a Virgin Hotel as well. Get approval. Developers get approval for things that don't actually get built because they're well, that's not, not true. Financeable and 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 things change. The economic uh, climate is very different today than it was, you know, five ten years ago. Whenever. I think it makes sense to do that. Um, it, to me, I mean, it, in in the um, specific downtown specific plan, it allows for residential. So I think the only reason we're not seeing it is because it's not financially beneficial to the developer himself. So the question is, the city's saying, yeah, sure. We already have a ton of residential all through our downtown. We just don't see any new buildings being built for that, although we have. I mean, if you think of the condos, I forget the name of them, the sort of Tuscan-themed one right behind La Valerie's, things have been getting built over the years that on available land for downtown. I think it's only a matter of, matter of time before Westman and Braun build a residential tower. They just need to have it be financially feasible. They're afraid of building condos because of the liability. This is what I've always heard from developers, the 10-year liability problem. That's why all the residential that is included in the downtown development is all rental right now because they just don't want the liability or they, or they want to own it for 10 years so it's no longer a problem. I just don't know what we can do here that's going to make a difference in that. Again. I, I hear what you're saying, Commissioner. I just don't know if it requires an action. I think when we're ready, when when developers are ready to start building residential downtown, they'll build it and we will buy them. <laughs> I just don't know that we need to take an action here on that. Unless, as you pointed out at the top of this, the city council wants to take some sort of action. So what would that be? Incentivizing again? Would that be some plan for incentivizing? I don't know. Doing, yeah, doing analysis is going to cost you, I don't know, fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, something like that. But what it would allow you to do, for instance, is learn that we require more parking than, so, so much parking that people have to do subgrade parking, subterranean parking. We say, yay, we love that because we don't want to look at it. But that makes the, that makes the majority projects cost prohibitive. Whereas if we were to allow on-grade pedis pedestal construction, type four pedestal, so that, and there are a couple of buildings like that kind of on North uh, Palm Canyon and in Indian Canyon. Um, if we were to allow that with 
that also requires greater building height, uh, but you don't necessarily have the active storefront or the active street front. If we were to allow that, then we might have developers who are ready to build now rather than waiting for market conditions to change five or 15 years from now. And you're absolutely right, we don't need to do it. It just would allow us more knowledge to tweak um, our criteria for downtown development, the requirements imposed as far as parking goes, as far as uh, heights go, um, the, the requirements for what your street furniture looks like. If we could tweak those and, and make it economically attractive with market conditions today, we would be more likely to see that happen in the near future rather than simply waiting for time to change. I think, uh, frankly, I think, um, Commissioner Hirschbein summed it up right away. We have heard from, uh, the market has spoken and the market will speak again. And I, I don't hear anybody in the community crying out for housing downtown. And again, and it's fully available in the specific plan. And then outside of this, the downtown specific plan, there's tons of residential. So I just don't know what we'll gain here. I'm, I have huge respect for you and what you do in your history. I just, I'm not, I'm not seeing what we'll gain here right now. It seems to me anybody could bring a development. They could ask for any changes or special allowances they want to get something built. And if the city council and, and, and the planning commission as, as another body sees the benefit in that development, we'll make it happen. We'll work with them. Um, I mean, Director Fag, I mean, do you, Am I missing something here? Is this something, am I lost? Um, I, I won't address your being lost, but let me just talk about the market study generally. Uh, what Commissioner Alayan is, is indicating is that market studies help to inform land use decisions. And had we been given the money back when we started this project in late 2018, early 2019, um, it would have been wonderful to be able to do that, uh, to really help to support some of the land use decisions we're making. Um, it's a little bit late in the process to do that. In order to do it now, we would have to look at extending the contract with PlaceWorks in terms of the time frame to do the changes. We would also need to possibly redo some of the environmental work that's being done for the housing element to accommodate any changes the market study might suggest to the land use element. Um, so there's a couple of problems, but one of the other benefits of doing this type of market analysis is it would help the city in its economic development program by specifically looking at, do we have the appropriate types of land to encourage diversification of our economy? And that's one of the ways that I think it really could benefit the city. That, you know, we've always been very tourist dependent. We've always wanted to, to branch out and to, to have a more diverse economy. And land use is a big part of that. Having adequate land to be able to do that is a big part of it. A, a market study would help us do that. So not only would it be beneficial in land use decisions, but also in economic development areas. Uh, but as I had said, it's a little bit late in the process for this limited general plan update, um, but it might be beneficial in other areas. Yeah, it just doesn't seem linked to, to what we're doing at this particular moment to me, and it seems like a council call because it then starts us down a whole new path. Why don't we leave this as a council call? I think, I think at this point at 9.30 at night, um, with not, not unified agreement on this, we can say we've discussed it and didn't come to a resolution. Well, I just want to say for the record, I'm not opposed to it. I just don't know how it relates specifically to what we're doing this moment. It's a bigger concept. 
it, and it's, it's, a, it's another can we would be opening. It relates yeah. more to the general plan. If the general plan update is broader than more limited, which some of the council members have wanted. Well, and if, I just haven't heard that. So if that's the case, I think they should ask us to do it or ask staff to do it and ask us to be part of it. Um, can we let that go? The only other item, and I don't think it was on our agenda, although we got letters regarding it, were boulders and crescendo. I have a question about the surrounding land use designations. I can't figure out on the map. What surrounds each of those in terms of land use designations? Because I can't find, I don't know where they are in this map. Can we back up for a minute? What are we supposed to be doing about crescendos and I don't boulders? I know that it's in front of, it's, it, it belongs to the city. So I don't know that it's in front of us. It's not, it seems to me that's another issue as well. It's, it's not before us right now for any action. Is that correct as relates to land use designation? It, it's got a land use designation, which is how the city acquired it uh, with an appraisal. And the city has decisions to make as to, uh, when they took it, I believe they intended to make it um, open space, but I think they've other issues have come up and I do think it's a council decision. When I was on the city council when we got it, and we talked a lot about converting it to open space. And the city council just never really went beyond it from my understanding. But are they asking us now to take that up or not? I think that, again, that has to be driven by them as well. We're taking up something that they didn't ask us to take up, right? So here's what I might recommend. You have had comment, public comment about boulders and crescendo. Um, based on what you've said thus far, I think it would be more appropriate for staff to indicate to council that the Planning Commission has deferred to City Council relative to the land use designation for boulders and crescendo. And I think that's where the appropriate decision lies. So I agree. I agree, Director. And, I, and if the council then wants to bounce it back to us, have us study it and make a real designation, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. But right I, now, we're picking right. some specific area of town and, 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 and talking about it when the city council, it's city land that they didn't, the council didn't ask us to consider right now. Yeah, I agree with that. So I guess that's how we've addressed the uh, the public inquiry by saying, well, you know, it's not our purview. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the city, it is our purview, Pete, but when we're asked to take it up is our purview. The city council didn't ask us to pick up any area of town specifically and act or recommend on it. We're looking at the, the total picture right now for the state requirement. This is a bigger issue. True enough. So any public comment that doesn't relate directly to something that's already been proposed here, we just say, well, you know, that's not part of our, we have not been asked to look at that. So I'm sorry, we're not gonna deal with it. I mean, that that's. We, no, we took in all public comment and we listened. And so that's all we have to do? Some of our actions. But this I, I, think, I think by referring it to council, we have dealt with it. I mean, is that correct, staff? I mean, have we dealt with it by saying, well, you know, we appreciate your comment, but, you know, that's really a council issue right now. Yes, you have, actually. Um, uh, because it has unique circumstances, it's land that has been given to the city. Uh, ultimately, city council decides on the use of city property, city lands. Uh, so I think it's more than appropriate to defer to the city council to provide direction uh, relative to boulders and crescendo. As Commissioner Roberts has stated, they might kick it back to you all to study the item further. And uh, at that point, we would schedule it for a public hearing and, and consider alternatives for those sites. Uh, but until then, I think it would be helpful for the Planning Commission to have direction from the city council 
and uh, based on the unique circumstances of the land and how the city acquired it. Okay. Well, it or like at least know what they're thinking on it. They might have thoughts and we don't know what they are. Right. Well, that's and I have to know those before we act on it. So then the last thing is there was a question about Palm Hills that was raised by the Sierra Club. Does that fall into the same category? It's not owned by the city, it's private land. I think what we what happened in Palm Hills. We would be chased to look at it if they would like us to. No, no, no. Palm Hills was acquired by the city. There was about forty some acres acquired. Palm Hills? No, no. Oh yes, Palm Hills. It was up on the bluffs, and the city recently sold it to a conservation organization. They did. Yes. So it why was, is the Sierra Club asked? I'm sorry, I don't know what the what Sierra they Club wanted it, What they wanted was, what they asked was to have the zoning on it reflect the new ownership and the conservation designation. It's, uh, it is deed restricted, probably with the funding they use to acquire uh, to be used for conservation. And it's only, it's not the whole 400 acres on top. It's 40 acres right at the bluffs. Yeah, almost But Do you think there then that we should just ask staff to change, recommend changing the land use designation to what it now is? Yeah, you, what we will do is we'll verify the parcels and the ownership of the parcels and then make sure that the land use designation is appropriate for the conservation use. And that's what Ms. Taylor asked us to, to look okay. at. So we would be happy to do that. It seems like something that we can appropriately do. And obviously the city council would be involved in it, but that's uh, that's not land that has a particular circumstance. It's changed its use. That's fine. Uh, are there any other comments before we adjourn this meeting? Madam Chair, uh, we as staff just have one and uh, uh, David, I'll go ahead and jump in here. We are making a presentation on the housing element tomorrow night to city council. Um, we have a very limited time to make the presentation, so we're not going to be telling them everything that you said in terms of the corrections and the additions, et cetera. Um, we'll try to generalize uh, your comments so that the city council understands the, the breadth of the discussion that you had. Um, we are passing your comments directly on to our consultant who will then be updating the draft document to reflect the changes that you are making but I just wanted you to be aware that we're not gonna be able to go line by line tomorrow night with the city council uh, because their time is much more limited than yours. And so if you don't hear us say some of the things that you said, it's not that we've forgotten about them or that we're ignoring them. It's just that we have a very short time frame, uh, and your comments along with their comments will be forwarded on to our consultant. Where there may be conflicts between your direction and the city council direction, we will mention that to them tomorrow night as those items come up. Uh, but again, uh, we are we do have a complete record of the things that you said and the changes that you've asked us to make, and we will be passing those on to the consultant. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Thank you. Um, uh, we we have a meeting next week. Yes. So we are adjourning this meeting until the July 28th. Wednesday, July 28th at 5.30. Good evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Recording stopped.